This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetacy. I'm Bridget Fetacy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. Our sponsors this week are Beta Brand, The Jordan Harbinger Show, and Calm. Find out why women are ditching typical work pants for Beta Brand's dress pant yoga pants. Go to betabrand.com slash walkin for 30% off. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show, that's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. For listeners of the show, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash walkin. This week on the podcast, I'm excited to welcome Nick Gillespie. The tables have turned. He's interviewed me before. He's the host of The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie, a weekly podcast of relentlessly interesting interviews with the activists, artists, authors, entrepreneurs, newsmakers, and politicians who are defining the 21st century. I have no idea why I was part of that group, but it was a great interview. I love Nick. We're friends. Nick is also the editor-at-large at Reason, the libertarian magazine of free minds and free markets. I'm with Nick Gillespie, everyone. Overdue, I would say. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. That you've, this, now the tables have turned because yes. you interviewed me. <laughs> and you're a very good interviewer. Oh, well, thanks. I appreciate that. I, uh, I don't think so. And so I'm always kind of amazed when people say that. But uh, one of the things I've tried to do over the past couple of decades is to um, actually learn how to take compliments. <laughs> um, and again, it's not like I get a lot. So that's maybe every time I'm like, what is, what is happening? This strange thing. No, your th your questions were thought provoking, Good. and it's always interesting to me when someone asks me a question that I haven't either been asked or framed something in a way that forces me to think about something differently. Well, one of the things, as long as we're doing a kind of mutual admiration society, um, you know, I really, in a, in a way, I came to know you through my younger son, who's a big fan of like podcasting and stuff. He's nineteen years old. And I love people like you who have really taken full advantage of like new platforms and mm. new media to just emerge and, you know, and then get like a gigantic, really devoted, intense and broad audience. Yeah. I, I mean, it's just, and, you know, I can remember going back, you know, now like 20 years or so at the, at the dawn of kind of blogging and stuff like yeah. that, there were people <laughs> Like uh, Glenn Reynolds, uh, who's you know online as Instapundent, uh -huh. who you know he was a he's a Harvard trained law, law professor at University of Tennessee and everything, and he was well respected in his field. But when he created Instapundent, like it was taking advantage of the web at at a at a good moment, and he just became this great focal point on online that couldn't have existed before. And I love that. I love seeing when things like that happen. Yeah. Um, so kudos to you for you know, reaching, uh, reaching an audience that otherwise it, it would, would have been almost impossible to reach, you know, even 10 or 15 years ago. It was quite accidental. Mm -hmm. And I, and, and, but in, I, I say that, and then I think back to 2013 when I, when I came back from traveling and went on mm -hmm. Twitter and then decided that I was going to treat Twitter like somewhat of a job. I didn't have a job. Right. But I saw a lot of writers on there, mm -hmm. and they were more in the industry I came out here to be in, which was writing Hollywood and mm -hmm. jokes and comedians and late night. And I realized that I could practice just the craft of telling jokes. And this is when it was still, you could only do 140 characters. And I could also reach people in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. It was like, that to me just was eye-opening. And I said, well... If I have an audience, I don't really need anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah no. I don't need a gatekeeper. <laughs> yeah, you can build. Uh, you can build all the other stuff mm -hmm. after. And it, I mean, I'm very active on Twitter, and I enjoy it a lot. I do feel like it's becoming less and less 
you know, just worthwhile. Um, and it, and it killed me, you know, last fall, when, uh, particularly when, you know, when they blocked access to that New York Post story about Hunter yeah, that Biden was crazy. and stuff. Yeah, crazy. And just to see on a platform that I remembered, you know, it's f one of its first big early kind of successes was in helping people in the Arab Spring to communicate. Right. And then suddenly they're blocking access to articles in major publications, too. It's not like, you know, but uh, having said all of that, what was great about Twitter is it allowed it, it allowed new voices to, to kind of bubble up. And uh, you see that on TikTok and whatnot. It was yeah. not necessarily political. And then the other great thing about it, and I think this is true of the best forms of kind of social media or new media, whatever we want to call it, is that they level the distinction between, you know, the high, you know, the high and the mighty and just the hoi polloi or the rabble. And, you know, I, one of my favorite moments on Twitter, this was, I don't know how many years ago, but Bill Cosby, just as he was starting to get dragged for, right. you know, all of his sexual assaults. That must have been 2013. Yeah, I guess so. It's, yeah, it's a, I got it. It, you know, both seems older than that and, and just like yesterday. But he, on his Twitter feed, he put out a thing, um, you know, saying like, because he was, he was doing a Netflix special or something like a, right. a, a, a uh, you know, a return uh, to touring, you know, comedy video uh, tour or whatever. And he, um, his, uh, his account had this thing like, you know, put our, uh, put your favorite uh, pictures of Bill Cosby in sweaters. Oh, know, gosh. I'll post them here. And then it was just immediately, you know, just like mocking him so mercilessly. <laughs> and that happens time and time again. And like, you know, that, it, you know, the access changes, like the gate suddenly, you know, the people who think, you know, they are, you know, figurative gatekeepers and they've locked the gates. Then they realize, oh, no, the doors swing in or something, yeah. you know, and, and then it's just, I love that. This is the that. Wall Street bet stuff that yeah. we've been seeing. Yeah, why yeah. I've been like, hurrah! Yeah. yeah, and you know, and it, all of this stuff gets more complicated, and it's only, it's a series of, in the 90s, there was a, a guy who later turned out to be involved in like NAMBLA, so you know, you have to take his social <laughs> theories, uh, or his theories of disruptive social change with, you know, a huge grain of salt <laughs> and or, you know, a listing on a sex offender registry. Right. But this guy, Hakeem Bey, had this concept of temporary autonomous zones, mm. or TAS. And, you know, a Burning Man was like one of the paradigmatic examples of this. But, you know, it's just what that at various moments, even in the most repressive systems, these weird little brigadoons pop up where suddenly people are able to do stuff that they weren't able to do and you know in this moment of freedom uh you know they just create really interesting stuff that almost always immediately or or ultimately gets constrained and kind of reabsorbed into the status quo but yeah. it's like glorious living in those tazes those temporary autonomous zones and i think uh, social media is one of these. It's like a virtual Taz. Yeah. And they yeah. keep popping up. That's right. And it, and it is changing because, you know, it's like, you know, something like Twitter it just seems more <laughs> constipated, not because Jack Dorsey has stopped going on urine drinking retreats in Myanmar or something <laughs> to, you know, actually uh, vet every tweet. But the way people act on that, and once you know, you know, once Justine Sacco or was that her name? Uh, she, yeah, yeah. Justine landed. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, but when she, you know, showed how Twitter could destroy your job, you know, in the span of like you know a couple of hours, uh, you know, people tighten up. Yeah, and it becomes less interesting in a way, and so it's still good but it's maybe not as fresh and then you're looking for the next thing. Yeah, it's it's been, it's funny, I was joking, I just got my computer back out of the shop and I tweeted about it and everyone yeah. made Hunter Biden jokes uh, right. because obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, Who, and Hunter, if I'm not mistaken, is either in or moving to Los Angeles. He's oh, gonna really? Be, he's going to be moving to Venice. To become a porn star? Uh, you know, <laughs> I think he already is a porn star. So maybe he's just, <laughs> he's like a Simba. He's just reclaiming the throne. <laughs> But uh, yeah, he's supposed to be out here, and he's got a um, he's got a uh, he's going to start a podcast. Oh. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, I'm actually very interested in reading his book. You know, which I, I I doubt that he wrote. He may not have even read. But you know, these formal versions of stories mm. are interesting. You know, regardless of who produces them, they tell us something about something. Mm -hmm. But so. So I I made this joke and or I mentioned that it was in the shop and then I all these jokes this goes back to your censorship mm. the jokes themselves about Hunter were 
you know, when they get uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. blocked for... Uh, what, are, con- do they say, like, the, you know, some replies may be uh, it was, offensive? Or yeah, it was, like, on t- yeah. offensive material I or something always, like that. It I was am, crazy. I have always been disappointed when I see in my replies or something, it says, like, this may contain offensive material. I'm like, bring it on. And then it's, and then it's just something nothing. stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's so... I, it was, it's, it, yeah. I'm like, they're still censoring any mention of Hunter yeah. on Twitter. Yeah. That's just wild to me. It used to be so crazy. It felt very much even when I went on. So I first logged in in 2008. And mm-hmm. this was when I didn't understand it at all. And it was still pretty new. So it, it wasn't as you still had to kind of like at people and it right. looked clunky. And I remember it was when Ashton Kutcher was racing CNN for a million followers. And I oh, was right. sick yeah, in yeah. bed. Right. I just had a cold. And I was like, I'll check out Twitter. And... I was like, whoa, this is bad. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is not good. Yeah. This is how we get someone like Trump is someone has as many followers as an entire news organization. I, I want to say, and as somebody who enjoyed that 70s show, you know, I think it's a better world when Ashton Kutcher is beating CNN for, you know, almost anything. I agree. I, you know, in the long run, Ashton Kutcher has made a bunch of dubious arguments he, he's wrong about kind of sex trafficking and things like that mm. but it's kind of great when cnn which itself usurped you know nbc abc cbs right. and by the late 80s you know as kind of being important then got supplanted by you know fox news a decade later or whatever i you know it's kind of great it's, it is it's all it's just this churn or creative the destruction yeah you know, that uh that is good and and for me the, the real issues, and I realize I'm hop skipping around here, but for me as a libertarian and somebody who's worked at Reason Magazine for most of my professional career, one of the questions is that creative destruction is good, mm-hmm. I think. You know, it opens things up, it keeps the world interesting, it makes it more fair, it makes it fresh and worth getting up in the morning, but it is hard, mm-hmm. like that constant pace. And so, what are the what are the kind of institutions, what are the individual psychologies, what are the the kind of shared guidelines we have so that people don't get freaked out and say, okay, you know, a creative destruction was great right up until now. Right. And now we have to stop it. And this is for me, in a lot of ways, that's what libertarian politics and culture is about. It's like, how do you, how do you create a world where you can kind of roll with everything and like people don't get too far left behind or the change doesn't seem so threatening and disruptive that suddenly somebody like Joe Biden or somebody like Donald Trump say, I, you know what, the world was better when I was 35 and the Cleveland Browns were really still in Cleveland. So that's where we're going to make that world over. Right, and, right. Um, you know, which is, I think, the root of many, many problems. Yeah, the, it was an interesting time and it, it made me realize how level the playing field really was because... I was just trolling them, obviously. <laughs> and I said, Ashton was saying something about how he was get, you know, he's like an organization is donating, donating mosquito nets um, for malaria if mm. you if we hit a million first. And I was like, hey, you're rich. Why don't you donate mosquito right. nets? And then he tweeted, somebody said we should match their donation. And I agree. And we're going to. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. They're listening. <laughs> why it didn't was you like ask this. for something good? Why didn't <laughs> you say? Why don't you buy? Give me a billion dollars. I also you know? was trolling He's them obviously because very suggestive. <laughs> you know? I was like, "You and Demi aren't going to make it." And then oh, she blocked yeah. me. And then they didn't make it. I That's was right. They should have yeah. listened. I think I may have more sympathy for her than for him. <laughs> but then, you know. But then I've seen too many of her movies, so you know it all goes out the window. <laughs> I I definitely that was that weird moment of of the fl- the flattening of yeah. oh these celebrities if they're running their accounts they hear you yeah. <laughs> and then of course you know now we have you know a world in which celebrities probably don't even read their accounts much less run them where there's a lot of pay for play uh, which I I don't think there should be a law against that but people have to become critical of media. Um, you mm-hmm. know, in, in all its forms so that, you know, when uh, Kylie Jenner or, you know, anybody starts talking about a product, you know, you should realize that they're probably being paid. To right, say that right. I'm a big uh, Bruce Jenner fan, as well as Caitlin. I actually, uh, I used to be a columnist for the Daily Beast and I wrote a 
sorry, when Bruce Jenner uh, transitioned into being Caitlin, I said, this is like the ultimate American dream, like the winning the gold medal and beating the Russians in the decathlon in 76 and the Montreal games was great. Mm -hmm. But this is really the true American dream where you can become like, if you're Bruce Jenner, you can become the world's greatest athlete. And if you're, and then you can become Caitlin Jenner. Right. Um, having said all of that, when you look at the ways in which people oftentimes consume celebrity culture and whatnot uncritically mm -hmm. it, it's worrying to me because it's the same problem with politics when you if you take these people transparently when they haven't earned that you know we're in big trouble yeah you um i have a couple questions that you mentioned things have you ever been to burning man i have not my, you, my you girlfriend to to has been there i was a gonna times. say i was living i you know i moved how is that possible i was Sarah? in i was in grad school in uh buffalo new york i i got a phd in literature from uh, american literature from suny buffalo from state university of new york at buffalo i was working towards that when i got the job at reason i was married at the time and my wife was eight months pregnant when we moved to LA and a friend of mine or a colleague of mine, Brian Doherty, who's been going to Burning Man for, you know, I mean, since it was on the beach almost. in San Francisco. It, it, no, he only went in Nevada, but it was pretty shortly after it had moved to mm -hmm. Nevada and everything. And he wrote the first kind of full length book uh, 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 about it as a kind of sociological phenomenon called This is Burning Man, which I think came out in like 97 or 98 or mm -hmm. something. And I had the opportunities back in the early or in the mid 90s because I moved out here. I was here from 93 to 96. And I just, didn't have the money uh, and, you know, so many other things were going on. And then I, you know, I would like to go and I, you know, um, but by the same token, I feel like I, I understand it, uh, which is not, you know, true until you've actually lived it. But right. Have you been to Burning Man? I went once and I was sober, yeah. which is shocking yeah. considering my history with drugs and alcohol mm -hmm. that I got gifted tickets and I was on my way out of LA for what would end up being a couple of years traveling around the world. But I just had been in LA grinding and needed to just, I was like, I don't want to be 40 and not have traveled. Right. And I felt stagnant. I was heartbroken. It was a whole series of things. And um, as I was packing up to just put my stuff in storage and sublet my place for a year, my friend was like, you're the only person I know who could go to Burning Man on a two days, two day notice or whatever. And I said, you know, people spend six months preparing for this. There's no way. And I'm preparing to leave. But of course, I couldn't say no. And it was the rite of passage year. So it was 2012 or 2011. Oh, 2011. Oh, I was going to say because 2020, uh, 2012 2011. was the year of the uh, Aztec apocalypse or something. Oh, right. right. Yeah. 2011 was rites of passage and it felt... It felt appropriate. So I went with this woman and she left after two days and I ended up staying with the people who had had these extra tickets and I had a great time. Yeah. I was, I didn't know. I took to it like a duck to water. Yeah. You know, they were, there are all these different types of, they had this little flyer and it was like all the different Bernie man types right. and it was the, the newbie. But uh, you know, I took, I just took right to it. Yeah. I was like, on my bike, topless, loving it. Yeah. And <laughs> I, you know, you don't need drugs my, either. <laughs> my girlfriend, Sarah, who is with me out here in LA, we're here for a bit, uh, sitting out winter and COVID in New York. And we're living in Venice. And, it, you know, she says it's very much kind of like Venice or, you know, and, and obviously Burning Man is, you know, ha was drawing on a large number of different kinds of uh, alternative communities mm -hmm. and intentional communities and stuff like that. You know, so I kind of get a sense of it. I like, I think the real question in a way is like, can you, can you actually create a world that is like Burning Man, you know, for 11 months out of the year, as opposed to, you know, a couple of weeks and it might be too much, right? It's, I, I mean, first of all, it's insanely expensive to yeah, go. Know, of so this idea that people have that you are going and they're like, oh, it's just barter system. Right. Like, yeah, once you spend the <laughs> minimum of three thousand dollars just yeah. to get there. Well, you, this is a dirty secret of a lot of stuff, but it's also good, and it's good to know this because it, you know that everything, almost everything we do, that's intentional. You know, and and I don't just mean like, oh, you know, we're going to live in a Quaker community <laughs> or something, but every, you know, you have to satisfy basic needs right. and wants first, and. 
you know, what's great is that we live in a world where that is more and more the case for more and more people. Right. You know, where we, we have our basic food, clothing, shelter covered, and then we face that existential dread of like, how do I make meaning in my life? And I think this is partly where American society has gone insane. Like we, we, you know, we, we've covered our basics and we don't know how to create meaning anymore because of the end of religion, which is a good thing as far as I'm concerned, the end of a lot of gatekeeper institutions, not just legacy media mm -hmm. and douchebag political parties, but you know, in our everyday lives, like we, nobody takes for granted that, oh, I should be doing what my father did and my grandfather, et cetera, down through the ages. Like the world is new to each of us. And that's also really hard, but I would love to kind of try to approximate a world where you're you're living your life as a work of art. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. As a woman who works from home, my day is a little bit chaotic and all over the place in terms of what I have to do and the many different hats I have to wear. Just an example of today was doing a podcast, having an interview, and then heading out to a doctor's appointment. And Beta Brand gave me the pants that I never needed to change throughout all of those different transitions. This is what I love about Beta Brand. I can wear them in the morning when I go for my walk. I can wear them to my podcasts or interviews. I can wear them doing errands. They're super comfortable. They're not frumpy. They look stylish. They're adorable. They make your bum look incredible. They're stretchy. Their customer favorite dress pant yoga pants are made of wrinkle resistant stretch knit fabric, making them perfect for literally anything you need to do. Those are the ones I was wearing today. There are tons of different colors and styles to choose from like boot cut, straight legs, skinny, cropped and more. Women love these pants because they fit so well and feel great on allowing you to be confident and comfortable as you get shit done. Right now, our listeners can get 30% off their first Beta Brand order when you go to betabrand.com slash walk-in. That's 30% off your first order for a limited time at betabrand.com slash walk-in. Ladies, these pants are seriously amazing. They're my favorite. It's pretty much all I buy anymore. Find out why women are ditching typical work pants for Beta Brand's dress pant yoga pants. Go to betabrand.com slash walk-in for 30% off. Do you think that there is a religious like gene that we have to, you know, I look mm. at the kind of religion on the left and many of those people are atheists or come out of that atheist world and or have rejected religion. And I'm wondering if it's just something in our DNA that we have to be religious yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's genetic per se. And, you know, I, I come from, my grandparents were all uh, from peasants who had been peasants for thousands of years in Ireland and Italy. So like, you know, genetic arguments make me squirm because like I'm a double genetic loser. I am you, too. Yeah, you know, so it's like, <laughs> uh, but having said that, Long I mean, it's clear, too. It, uh, you know, something like religion is probably part of evolution mm -hmm. and it's everywhere. Right. And when you get rid of, you know, God, you replace it with Gaia or something like that. I think a lot of, you know, the interest, and, and I don't mean this to diminish it necessarily, but a lot of the interest in environmentalism and a lot of the religious kind of versions of environmentalism that come. I think it's because religion isn't there anymore. And right. you fill the void with something else, uh, you know, and it could yeah. be deism, it could be Marxism, it could be, uh, you know, I guess it could be capitalism, but you know, you create your God. That's going to be my new God. <laughs> what is it, Marxism or capitalism? Capitalism. <laughs> uh, capitalism is a pretty good God, you know? Uh, you know what's great about <laughs> capitalism is it's a servile God. Like think about it. You are offering something that people want and they're willing to, you know, pay you money in mm -hmm. various ways. And like they're happy with the deal and you're happy with the deal. Otherwise, you stop doing it. And, you know, there are perversions of it. And, there, you know, there are, are you know, sweatshops. And, and I wouldn't even say sweatshops per se, but there are places where labor is forced. Right. Or, or you're, you know, you're, you're pushed to do certain jobs or you're not allowed to do other kinds of jobs. But, you know, in the abstract, and I think in most aspects of the kind of new economy, me. capitalism is pretty great i agree i mean i definitely think it's done whenever i talk to uber drivers mm -hmm. and and people who have come from other countries they are always talking about how much their country has changed back in ethiopia right. or wherever 
just when they go, they're like, there are roads and bathrooms and yeah. things that we've taken for granted our whole life. And that is virtually capitalism. <laughs> yeah, know, it is. Just... Yeah, I mean, it, it really <laughs> is some kind of like market exchange. And, you know, that's predicated upon people having some basic rights and owning themselves and owning, you know, and being able to make decisions. What do you think about universal basic income? I'm not a fan of universal basic income. I uh, I might be persuaded into going for a universal minimum income. Mm. And let me just explain the differences without getting too uh, tendentious or boring about it. But a universal basic income would mean that you and I and Bill Gates and you know a homeless person would all get you know a thousand bucks a month or two thousand bucks a month. I don't need it. You don't need it. The the really rich people don't need it. Um, and government, you know, government can't do everything for everybody. And we're broke. I mean, the government, we have $23 trillion in debt, you know, in a, in a couple of months, it'll be more than that in a decade, it'll be, you know, double that. I know. And you run out of the ability, the government runs out of the ability to pay for stuff. Um, so I think what government should be doing is targeting, uh, you know, we should have a social safety net that is paid for through taxes or other kinds of, you know, collective exchange and, and, and kind of sharing uh, that actually targets people who need help. Uh, because I think if, if government was trying to help fewer people, it, and if we had a shared sense of, okay, what are interventions supposed to look like and what are they supposed to achieve, we would do better at it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm sick of uh, the way, I was just on a debate that's gonna air in a couple weeks on Intelligence Squared, which is this great service that's based in New York and they put on these debates. But I was on with a couple of people, uh, and it was about forgiving student debt. Mm -hmm. And I was on the team that said, no, don't forgive st student debt. You know, there are certain cases where, yeah, you would want people to be able to get rid of it and stuff. But, you know, one of my points was I paid for my college partly through taking on debt. Um, and I paid it back and I, you know, and I benefited from going to college and now I make more money partly because I go to college and I, if I was able to pay for my kids college by saving. Right. I don't need forgiveness for student debt. Right. And like, you know, and like these people on the other side and people like Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders will say, oh, we should forgive all student debt, either up to $50,000, which is the max that you can borrow from the government for undergrad or, you know, or all of it. Like, so if you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer, you get to fucking, you know, get rid of your debt. And it's kind of like, no, that's wrong. Like we don't have unlimited money and like help people who can't afford college to be able to go to college. Right. It's a subset. Only about 56% of undergrads borrow to, to go to undergrad anyway. And it's like, you know, we, we need a government that does fewer things but does them well and with a real goal in mind. And so universal basic income, to my mind, is a way of shifting money to the middle class and to the upper middle class or rich under the guise of helping the poor. And we're doing this all the time. All if the I can time. just be a jerk and talk about like actual politics stuff, the American Rescue Act that just passed, you know, $1.9 trillion in it, among other things, there's child tax credits that go up to households making like over $200,000 a year. Mm -hmm. It's like, fuck you. Like you, you can pay for your kids. It has Obamacare subsidies that only max out at uh, households making $580,000 a year. Are you fucking kidding me? Right. And again, I say this, you know, I'm a capitalist. I'm a libertarian. I like rich people. I respect them. Almost all of them get their money by making something valuable that right. people want or being valuable themselves. But it's like it, there's something sick in America when really wealthy people, people making double or triple or infinite, you know, an uh, uh, infinite amount more than the average household are getting money from the government. Yeah, like, that's, that's crazy. Stupid, you know? Yeah, and I I worry about the dollar. <laughs> yeah, of course, because <laughs> I I do think. One of the things that's coming up, and I was actually talking to Michael Malice about this just yesterday, is, you know, he's in New York, I'm mm -hmm. here in LA, and they've kicked the can down for evictions and foreclosures until mm -hmm. July. And I was saying, you're going to see a mat. There's, I, if you couldn't, I didn't understand this. When they gave extra unemployment and said, you don't have to pay your rent, mm -hmm. how could many of the people who can't pay their rent are in rent controlled places in Santa Monica? So if you couldn't pay $1,200, why would you think they could pay 10000 at the end of this? Right. Unless they saved all their extra unemployment, which 
is probably not what no. the majority of people did. And, and I mean, people are being told like, oh, spend the extra money in order to stimulate the economy or something. So right. you know, it's all- It screwy. seemed like it should have been one or the other. But now, yeah. it, it, so he said, no, they're just, they're not going to let that happen. They're not going to let people foreclose yeah. and they're not. But then what happens to well, inflation and reason, what happens to our dollar? Yeah, Reason has a, a very good uh, a documentary, a, a Reason uh, video uh, by Jim Epstein, one of my colleagues there, about um, the eviction moratoria mm. uh, or moratorium. You know, landlords, it's not like most landlords own the buildings. Like they have mortgages themselves. Right. And so if they're not being paid, they're getting squeezed by the bank. And it's just this this kind of issue keeps running through the economy. Um, and um, so it, there's going to be a reckoning because there always is, and it's not gonna be pretty. And you know, one of the problems is, is that you know, when you start these programs, uh, it becomes very hard to get rid of them. Um, and so you know, come July, they're probably gonna be like, oh, okay, well, we're not gonna let people actually be evicted now, so we're gonna extend it another couple months, another couple months. You mentioned rent control. Rent control as a phenomenon in America only really came into widespread being after World War II when GIs were returning okay. to places like New York City and whatnot. So there was a housing crunch because suddenly you have a couple of million people all flooding back home. Uh, you know, and it was put in as a temporary measure to uh, kind of deal with World War II, uh, you know, the outcomes of that. And then it was in place in New York until the like 90s or early 2000s. And in, you know, in California, it was only banned like classic rent control was only banned by the state in the 90s so it's we like, yeah. still have it, it though no, it's rent right? stabilization so it's a little bit different oh okay because yeah. i know santa monica they still consider it rent control i right. think but I, i'm not sure uh but and and a lot of places do have rent stabilization but the idea like true rent control where rent would not go up or it was severe you know for it was you know that has mostly disappeared partly because even or potentially even especially left-wing people who care about poor people realize it had a very it, it didn't have the intended consequences uh you know of making housing more affordable it made le much less housing available and it made it easier for wealthy people to game a system right yeah i'm more i'm it's uh, the market here is still really high yeah the housing market. You know, my friend just bought a house and there were eight other people who put in. So I could, I was surprised because I thought for sure the market would come down. Yeah. I know it has in New York. It has and in San Francisco, at least in rentals uh, for sure. But it's all, you know, it, it remains to be seen exactly how the lockdowns, which were generally done as stupidly and arbitrarily as possible, <laughs> the longer, the, both the immediate and longer term economic consequences. Because this is, you know, one of the other things is that this $1.9 trillion stuff, which is a down payment. You know, Biden said, like, this is the opening bid. This isn't the, the end of what I'm doing. And we already spent like $4 trillion last year on COVID-related stuff. So there's more coming. But it turns out that if you were making more than about $50,000 a year, you didn't actually see much of an income decline. Right. And you couldn't spend it on anything. So like in many ways, people are pretty well off. The economy is already doing pretty well as the reopening is starting. If you throw $2 trillion on top of that, obviously things are going to go bananas for a while. But then is it going to be inflation? Is it going to be malinvestment? In the long run, most economists agree, whether they're left-wingers or right-wingers, that having massive, sustained, kind of uncontrollable national deficits decreases, it reduces long-term economic growth. Right. And one of the things that we need to be worried about, we were already in an era where from about 2000 on, we were averaging maybe like 2% annual economic growth rather than three or four. That compounds and it means a reduced standard of living from what could have been. Right. And, you know, obviously at this point, people now you have, the Republicans are useless on this. Um, because they gave up when they were in power, they realized, oh, you know, if we give money to the people we like or who vote for us, old people, especially, you know, you know, why should we care about spending too much money? They they don't have any argument against deficit spending. The Democrats don't, and you now have people basically taking for granted that the government can just keep creating money without any negative outcome. How did you become a libertarian? 
Uh, well, you know, like most of the things, it was in a public restroom, <laughs> uh, and an elderly gentleman, you know, offered to help me. Uh, I knew it. Yeah. Uh, That's no, how all uh, the good libertarians yeah, uh, are born. The, the way it happened, you know, I, I so I was in high school, and my older brother went to college. Uh, and like me, he went to Rutgers in New Jersey, which is where Milton Friedman, who's like king of the libertarian economists, mm-hmm. went. Uh, as an undergrad. And uh, my brother uh, discovered Reason Magazine, which was founded in 1968 by a a guy who later kind of went insane. Uh, He's like the Sid Barrett of political magazines, you know, of uh, of Pink Floyd or (laughs) Skip Spence. Like he just, he went nuts after starting something really kind of wonderful. Um, But um, so my brother started sending me Reason, uh, which is a libertarian politics and culture magazine. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting and I like this. And it had a lot of stories, uh, you know, that talked about the unintended consequences of things. And, you know, just to give a very quick example, they had a story I remember. This would, I would have read this sometime, maybe in the late seventies or in the early eighties at the latest, but it was about New Jersey where I lived, um, mandated everybody have car insurance Mm -hmm. because for a while there were states that didn't say you had to have car insurance, but then it was like, well, you know, if people don't have car insurance and you get into an accident and they're not insured, you're fucked. And so they mandated it. But then what that meant was that um, they needed to cover people who were essentially uninsurable because Mm. they were terrible drivers. So they created this state run assigned risk pool for really bad drivers and they taxed everybody and raised everybody's rates in order to pay into this pool. Uh, And the outcome was that actually, if like five years or something after New Jersey had mandated auto insurance, insurance cost more than ever, and there were fewer people with insurance because it cost so much. So it was like, wow, that's a fascinating kind of unintended consequence. And that's kind of political story or policy story reason would do a lot of. And I found that really fascinating, you know, because it allows you to be that guy who can be like, well, actually, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Um, and then uh, basically, so I started reading it. And then um, I can, when I went to college, I considered myself libertarian, um, you know, which meant that I was like pro-immigration. I was uh, kind of pro-free, uh, very pro-free speech pro all the social stuff like you know gay rights of course like any uh, individual should be allowed to do whatever they want as long as it, they're consenting with other people and things like that and then i went to grad school uh, after working for a few years and i would love to talk with you about my early journalism days as a teen magazine editor i would love to hear that yeah but by the time i got to grad school this was the late 80s and i was going for literary and cultural studies and this was the beginning of the first era of political correctness which ah. you know was called that and I, everybody i you know people really hated capitalism and they hated liberalism like classical liberalism the idea of individualism and limited government um you know, they were progressives, although they didn't really call themselves that at the time. And I realized I needed an ideology. And then I started relying more on reason and the whole host of thinkers who informed this tradition. And so that's, and then I, w- I was also a newspaper reporter for a while. And one of the things that flipped, I, you know, when you start out as a newspaper reporter and I worked for a bunch of crappy newspapers, or not crappy, but small newspapers in New Jersey, and you get sent to, you know, high school graduations where, I, I mean, I, there was like a 72-hour period where I saw something like eight or 10 high school graduations. Oh, God. And it's like, you know, suddenly school shooters kind of make a lot more sense, <laughs> to be quite honest, you know, or like, you know, the Ramones <laughs> at the end of rock and roll high school when Vince Lombardi High gets blown up. It's like, yeah, of course. Um, but, uh, but you also go to... The planning board meetings and zoning board meetings. Right. And just time and again, I would see these, you know, zoning board people like ranting at people who would come asking for a variance so that they could put like, you know, an extra building on their property or a fence. There was some guy, and I remember this was in central New Jersey, and some guy who didn't even realize like on his property, he needed to get permission to put like a three foot fence up around the perimeter. Right. It was like nothing, you know, it was like a, for looks. And it wasn't just like the zoning board was like, you know, you you have to get permission and we're going to fine you or something. They spent like 45 minutes ranting at like, who do you think you are that you can just wow. put up fences on your property? You know, and I was like, what the <laughs> fuck is going on here? And so that kind of stuff radicalized me. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't seem like libertarians are very radical. You know, it's it seems mm. radical now, but yeah, they yeah. seem... I mean, you work at a, a place called Reason, and right, I'm not yeah. sure if, yeah, yeah I don't right know on, if yeah. that's why, 
I mean, I, I saw that you you were re- retweeting something I said yesterday where I was like, can someone cancel me so I can get rich? Because I feel like if you take the position of just trying to look at the policy and the nitty gritty yeah. and maybe trying to evaluate things from both sides or right. all sides or as or many like sides the, as you yeah, can, yeah. Um, that no one cares. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll put it slightly differently and hopefully a little bit more not benevolent to uh, to libertarians uh, and reason certainly you know again we've been around for 50 years and we're doing really well in the internet you know when we were talking earlier about things being flattened like when we no longer had to rely on print in order right. to get subscriptions which just takes money to send mailing out to get a certain number of people to respond like we really grew in leaps and bounds in our website i you know i don't know it gets like nine million or eight million That's visits great. a month or yeah. something you know it's up a lot you know and and i mean we had peaked i think circulation peaked at like sixty thousand a month for right. print, which was good but it's like you know peanuts um but uh so there's there's a real flattening there but one of the things that really hurts us is that one we're not Polit- we're not partisan in terms of politics. We don't even back the Libertarian Party. Right. Um, and when you don't sign, if you're a political magazine and you don't roll with either the Democrats or the Republicans, it's really kind of like, oh, you can be interesting and you can be fun to bring to a party, but nobody's really going home with you. you know? <laughs> it's like, and it is true. I can't begin to tell how many times I've been, because I, I lived in Washington, D.C. for a while, and Reason is technically based in L.A., but we have a big office in D.C. <laughs> um, you know, like when you, when you would go to parties, whether it was Democratic, you know, mostly Democrats mm-hmm. or Republicans, everybody would always ask, like, oh, what are you carrying? You know, like, do you have some weed? Do you have some blow or uh-huh. something? Um, but... You know, because these politics, the way it's constituted in America is really about being tribal. And, you know, this explains why Republicans are so slavishly and pathetically, you know, tied to Trump. And before it, it was other shitty leaders. Right. You know, and Democrats are awful. Like, you know, Bernie Sanders and AOC, you know, there's going to come a point where they'll have a big break with Joe Biden. But right. they've been eating a lot of shit over the past couple of weeks. And we'll see how long that lasts. But, you know, it's tribal. And we're not, you know, we're not part of the gang. We, You know, and it's not because we wouldn't be. It's just because we're trying to maintain, you know, kind of adherence and allegiance to a set of ideas and a philosophy that we think in the long run helps individuals and communities and people be more free, more fair, and have more fun. Right. Why do people hate that so much? I really don't. Well, if you meet libertarians, you know, one at a time, it's kind of understandable. I did why go. They hate I went people. to a event that was, um, oh my gosh, it was. Who's the kind of famous uh, politician? Um, who they got mobbed outside D.C. He and his wife, uh, Rand Paul. Rand Paul. Yeah. And he was doing a book signing, and I went to it. It was at this yeah. house, and it was an interesting cast yeah. of characters yeah. who were at this event. And I was like, "Yeah, I can see why people don't like libertarianism." <laughs> <laughs> no, it was yeah. it was it wasn't. You know, the the Dems are good at making things shiny. Mm-hmm. I feel like Republicans they know how to get to their cheesy base. Like yeah. there's just something always yeah. perpetually cheesy to I, me. You know, for me, it's the, I, I always think about it more in terms of kind of choice versus control. And both Republicans and Democrats want to control people. Um, they want to control people, but they, what they want to control is a little bit different, although it's starting to converge and you see this, I'm, I'm working on a piece now, a, a video about how Republicans and Democrats or liberal and conservative politicians are equally trying to control speech. They're mm. doing slightly differently. And for some, you know, back in the nineties, this was clear, you know, Republicans hated, you know, uh, a TV that had sex in it and maybe drugs. Democrats hated TV that had violence and maybe drugs. They right. both hated drugs, <laughs> but you know, and so it's like, it's about choice versus is control and libertarians i think are good or this is you know one of our cardinal virtues or, or certainly our our drums that we beat all the time is that individuals should have more choices and freedom to exercise those choices and that 
that really, uh, you know, when you start to think about like Ted Cruz is not about choice. You know, he'll say, oh, we want school choice. But if you want an abortion, you know, you're out of luck. Democrats are like, you know, we'll drive you to Planned Parenthood, but don't think you're taking your kid out of that fucking K through 12. <laughs> right. you know, and it's kind of like, okay, how about this? This is a better <laughs> offering. You can get an abortion. You should pay for it yourself or have, you know, people pay for it. You know, if if you can, and then uh, you know, go to the school that is best for your kid. Right? Yeah, it's strange. I I feel like every one of us has a small tyrant just waiting yeah. to come out. Yeah, I think so. And I feel like that there is like a massive, like political homelessness. Obviously, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, you you are the uh, queen. I'm trying to think who's the most famous homeless woman in the world. <laughs> You are her. You're the Betsy Ross of political homelessness or something. Which I, you know, what are you, what do you think are the fair, why do people react so strongly to libertarianism? I see it even mm. in my community. They're like, oh, those freaking fence sitter, blah, blah, blah. Like, Yeah. I don't, I think it's less about fence sitting. And I think in some ways it is, you know, from, <laughs> from the left or, you know, liberals and progressives. And I, I like to think that there are serious differences between liberals and progressives, um, in that progressives are more interested in controlling more aspects of the economy and everyday choice making. And than, literally than everything, yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, but, <laughs> the internet, but, commerce. You know, one of the things is that, like, libertarians often will get uh, stuck on certain topics. So, like, they'll be talking, you know, for, and, and also, like, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll say, you know, like, all they care about are gun rights. You mm -hmm. know, and so, oh, the Second Amendment is the most important thing in the world. You know, and it's not even the First Amendment in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and so, like, if you're not a gun nut, to be quite honest, and, you know, and I, I, I'm convinced by just the basic facts that as guns became more permissible because state laws changed, more people were able to own guns and carry guns and operate guns under whatever circumstances they want, violent crime went down. So like mm. that's a pretty good argument for gun rights, but a lot of libertarians will be like, it, you know what, you said that, you know, submachine guns shouldn't be in vending machines next to heroin, like get out of here, you're not a libertarian. And that's gonna turn a lot of people off. You know, and then, and there's a lot, you know, a lot of talk about how secession is really important. And I kind of, you know, I like the idea of exit, that you can leave situations that you don't want, you know, that aren't serving you well. But sometimes there's a, you know, there is a uh, regrettable tendency among many libertarians to kind of talk about secession in the context of the Civil War without mm. kind of foregrounding the problem of slavery. So, right. You know, there's that. And then on the right, you know, it's like they love us for our, you know, I, I mean, it really is like being on the down low in many ways because they love us for our economic stuff, you know, deregulation. That works well. But then when, you know, suddenly if you're talking about Backpage or about porn, right. they're like, oh, no, well, you know what? It, we can't allow that because if we actually allowed people and a market to operate where it pro provides what people want, then there would be chaos because people would be jerking off all day and they would never get any work done right. or something. And it's like, no, that's only like Republican congressmen. Right. You know, uh, but stop but, projecting. You know, and then they're like, yeah. And then, they, and then they're like, oh, and by the way, you know, drugs are bad, but, you know, do you have anything? Right. You know, but again, I mean, you know, the, the onus isn't on the world to accept libertarianism. I mean, libertarians, we, we need to kind of figure out how do we persuade more people who are not as dogmatic or doctrinaire. And I think one of the ways that we need to do that, one of the things I've been doing lately is I use the phrase, or I use the term more as an adjective than a noun, because I think it's a tendency, it's a predisposition. Most people don't think about, try to make everything systematic so that if you're libertarian over here, you have to be in every aspect of your life. Right. And for me, it's more about kind of talking about a world in which the, the controls are loosened a little bit, so everybody has more ability and more freedom to, you know, buy what they want, eat what they want, marry who they want, live how they want. Um, you know, and, and as long as we're moving in the right direction, I think things are going pretty well. And I think that's a pretty palatable version of uh, what libertarianism is. And, you know, and this is one of the things when, you, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty old. I'm 57. And You're like when I, 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 you know, I, parts of me are even older, I suspect. No, you know, my friend parts. who's a Holocaust survivor <laughs> who lives right by here would shame you for even saying such words. 
Oh. Because he's 92. Yeah, okay. That, so, well, he's a survivor, right? Relative. You know? yeah. Yes. You are not old. So, well, in any case, what I was going to say, though, is that when I think about the world that I grew up in versus now, you know, virtually everything is so much better, partly because of these li- little libertarian victories you know, like not having to wear a suit and tie to work every day. Right. You know, uh, to stuff like that. Um, you know, that free speech, you know, which is now under attack in ways that it wasn't 50 years ago right. or 70 years ago. But, you know, it, I mean, you couldn't say fuck. Uh, you know, you couldn't, uh, you know, when you, and even now, when you look at like broadcast TV, you know, which is kind of hard to remember that even exists, but like, it's so constrained and constipated because it, you know, you have to be proper or this and that. Unless you're watching the Grammys. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> which I would, uh, I would, uh, you know, advise against. <laughs> this is a, this is another part of a libertarian world where like award show don't matter that much. Yeah, anymore. no, they because don't that's at only all. Like, it's only in a world where you don't have anything else to do that you're going to watch an industry, you know, congratulate itself. Right, you know? right. And, and it's like, we don't, you know, that's why nobody watches the Grammys or the Oscars or the baseball all-star game and stuff right. like that like we're so much freer um but that also puts in relief like a lot of negative things that are going on about you know um you know trying to control speech or regulate speech or or make it you know uh unavailable i'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor We've got a very different kind of sponsor for this episode, The Jordan Harbinger Show, which is a podcast you really should be listening to, aside from mine. And I know that every day somebody tells you that you just have to listen to some podcast and you nod and say, sure, and then you never listen to it. Don't let that happen here. Jordan's show, which Apple named one of its best in 2018, is aimed at making you a better informed, more critical thinker so you can get a sense of how the world actually works and come to your own conclusions about what's happening even inside your own brain. Each episode is a conversation with a different fascinating guest, and when I say there's something for everyone here, I really mean that. He's talked to people like Bob Saget about comedy, Oliver Stone about filmmaking and what it was like for him to be a cab driver before he even started making films. This week on the Jordan Harbinger show, he had Leah Remini on to talk about the Church of Scientology, which is exactly what it sounds like, a cult. I love listening to Leah. She has in-depth knowledge and experience and is no holds barred. She's hilarious and really brings an important perspective to something that is shrouded in mystery and often secrecy and corruption and is pretty terrifying once you really get in there. We really enjoy this show here at Walk-In's Welcome. There's a lot of overlap in what we're doing. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you listen to podcasts. What are the ways that you see conservatives trying to control and limit free speech and Dem- like on the li- progressive, I guess more than yeah. liberal side. Well, you know, I mean, here's here. Uh, first off, there are, there are a couple things. One is, you know, I make a pretty strong distinction between laws and between like what private businesses do. Right, and it's not that private businesses are above criticism, but like you criticize them and you complain and you tell them, you know what, I don't like this. I'm going to take my business elsewhere. Or like, this isn't serving your need. You persuade them laws you have to really push back on. And so, you know, here's uh, the the Kentucky state uh, led uh, state Senate just passed a bill, uh, which is going to the full legislature, you know, and they did this almost a year to the day on the anniversary of Breonna Taylor being killed shot to death in a no-knock raid that was on a flimsy warrant that should never have been issued, uh, et cetera. But they signed or they passed a bill saying that if you insult a cop or make a hand gesture, you know, basically give them the figure in a way that a normal person, you know, would would find offensive. Like you can be, you know, you can be fined and arrested. Oh, wow. And it's like, okay, that's a form of control of speech coming out of a, a conservative body that is so screwed up. Right. You know, it's beyond contempt. Uh, you know, uh, in in Colorado, there seems like a slippery slope. Yeah, it, and it's just like, what are you kidding? You know, like God, like that, get out of here. In Colorado, there's a state legis- uh, le- legislator who introduced something that would have like a commission that would investigate whether or not pub- uh, social media platforms. This is a liberal. You know, are they allowing hate speech and misinformation and mm-hmm. you know uh, conspiracy theories and stuff? And it's like. 
And then they would be able to like punish or force the social media platforms to change how they operate. Oh, that's wow. like a real, you know, that's a real co- attempt to control speech. At at the congressional level, you constantly are hearing people like Ted Cruz on the right and Elizabeth Warren on the left talking about, oh, well, you know, we need to regulate and control or break up Facebook, Twitter, blah, 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 because essentially they're allowing speech or activity that I don't approve of. These things bother me a lot. Having said all of that, you know, Twitter is become, you know, they are, it's just like, it, it's not a, as good a platform as it should be because they're up, you know, they're uptight about stuff. I find Amazon, which once, um, you know, which once, you know, the early iteration of Amazon was they wanted to sell every book that was in print right? because they could, because it was a virtual warehouse. It wasn't right. like your stupid B Dalton's or Walden books mm-hmm. at the mall or anything, right? They could, have, they had infinite shelf space. And now, you know, they, they clarified at the request of Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and Tom Cotton and stuff about why Amazon pulled when Harry became Sally. Right. Uh, which had been out for a couple of years, I right? Guess, you right. Know, that then, wasn't but, a new book. But but Amazon said, you know what? We're we're pulling all books that treat LGBTQ uh, and trans issues as as a mental illness, as a sign of mental illness. I think they are within their rights to do that, mm-hmm. and I think it's really a shitty thing to do because you know have the argument. But but this is where you know. So Amazon, Twitter, Facebook—they're all pursuing moderation policies that are so you know they're not gonna they're not gonna help squelch speech they're not gonna help us have better public conversations it's categorically different than a law but i think we should also talk about that and we should argue with the businesses that we go to or that that pay us you know patreon for instance like if patreon if substack if all of these people start saying uh, you know, we don't want you because we don't like your listeners or we think what you're saying are They're bad. They're like, already doing that. Yeah, and again, they technically are within their right, I think, to do it. Um, and it's better than having it regulated as a public utility or anything because then you don't get any innovation. Right. Uh, but having said that, I think, you know, we need to speak loudly. There's a... Um, political economist who uh, he's dead now but albert hirschman who in the early 70s wrote a book called exit voice and loyalty and it was about states and businesses and communities that were in decline like how do you make them change and he said you you can leave that's exit like you can just leave and start your own which is good um there's voice where you can try to work within the system to affect change and reform things and that's complaining it's like when your favorite restaurant gets rid of a meal tell them you know what the, what are you doing this is bad you know and like and you'll take your business elsewhere and then there's loyalty where you just suck it up and do whatever you know your your country or your business or whatever tells the party. you party yeah and you know and that's bad that's a bad option and i think we need to start pushing back because where we're at now is there are legal challenges to free expression which are deeply worrying but you know and political challenges but there's also a cultural challenge and i think this is also something that libertarians oftentimes like pull back because they're like well it's a private business so you know they can you know they can put lead in the the water if they want or something like that and it's like no you know what like we need to build a robust culture where we're not you know let's let's have more arguments rather than few arguments right i mean are there instances where regulation is good like building regulation or things that keep like you yeah. said regulating businesses that might be just interested in making money and not care right. about polluting the water i mean yeah there there are there are instances of that and there are certain things like air pollution for instance which are very difficult to you know like it's a com- what's called a commons problem you know it's hard to attribute all of the pollution to particular causes and then tax them or fine them so you come up with a kind of solution where we might say, you know, as a uh, as a society or as a jurisdiction, whether it's Southern California or the country, you know, the country, we're only going to allow this much of this pollution to be emitted, mm-hmm. and then we create, we figure out ways to minimize that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think with speech, though, you know, it's it's different in the sense that, like, you know, uh, when Harry became Sally, I just checked this this morning, no longer available on Amazon, but it is available on Barnes and Noble. Right. Okay. So that's good. But what I'm talking about, um, you know, so I think it's very rare when you would need for things like speech, where you would want the government to set 
regulation. Oh yeah, no, know? I don't. I don't but think we need to build like we're losing a culture of robust free speech. Um, where people argue in public, rather it is a lot, and the Republican or conservatives do this sometimes, but it's clearly more on the left right now, where they say, no, we don't even want to engage these arguments, right? and we're just shutting you down, and we're going to boycott you, we're going to cancel right. you, we're going to go after you in a way that is bad. And, right. it's, and it's bad, you know, all the way down. Yeah, they're, the it's funny because you're, coming on the heels of an interview I did with a, a adult porn, mm -hmm. a porn star. And we were talking about, I, you know, I would like to hope, you know, that adult porn star is being redundant. <laughs> adult film star, <laughs> a porn but, star. Uh, yeah, a porn star who's uh, also an adult. Uh, yes. Star, like an underage <laughs> porn star. That's when you need a bottom Yeah. Right? We had a great conversation. Yeah. And I mean, this is a conversation that constantly mm -hmm. comes up and it's, it's, one of the areas where I'm very libertarian mm -hmm. and like, oh, it's a private business, but these businesses are huge yeah, and they're monopolies right. in many yeah. senses of the word. So there's not, it's not an even playing field. Right. The stuff we saw with Parler and then Amazon, that yeah. shit is terrifying no, to and, me. And yeah, let's be clear. You know, one of the things when I talk about Albert Hirschman and Exit Voice and Loyalty, part of it and what people said was like, you know, you don't like it, go build your own. Right. So Parler did that. And, and then, then they, you know, and then Amazon Web Service was like, <laughs> we're going to come up with reasons to get rid of you. And again, you know, Parler did some things that were bad. Like they, I mean, they had bad web development and then right. they, they also, you know, according to Amazon, they contravene the terms, the terms of the contract and stuff. Having said all of that, I mean, we shouldn't kid ourselves that, you know, there's an attempt to like hunt, hunt people down, like hunt bad speech down and kill it. It's not about, you know, this is my house and you, you live by my rules. It's like the minute you leave your ha that house, and you build your own, then people come with torches to build, burn it down. Right, and we were talking about the more chilling aspect of this Patreon being another good mm -hmm. example where they kicked off, this was why there was that big exodus with Jordan Peterson, right. Sam Harris, Dave Rubin, yeah. after I believe it was Sargon <laughs> got kicked off. Sargon of Akkad or whatever. So and it's it was like, for something yeah. he said on an interview yeah. that wasn't even right. his YouTube yeah. channel. Yeah. It wasn't even on Patreon. No, I, I, I had, it's also, I just love the fact, you know, that like it's going to be Sargon and like Count Dankula who are the martyrs for free speech. Like I, I wish that we had better things to start with but yeah it's but troubling. that's the problem yeah. and then you dig down into that story and it's oh it's mastercard putting right. the pressure yeah. on patreon well and it's mastercard being squeezed you know and this goes back to things like Backpage and escort services you know mastercard and visa and paypal were getting squeezed by the government because it's like what you're facilitating sex trafficking by doing these kinds of, um, you know, transactions. But so is that the government squeezing MasterCard and Visa? Because yeah. this porn star was saying that she thought it was all laws and it turns out that it's just MasterCard and Visa. So she was saying the reason that you can only have four fingers in a butt mm -hmm. in, and, and not the whole fist is because MasterCard and Visa make these rules. They may, uh, you know, they may come up with uh, uh, what I'm saying is that a lot of businesses, uh, and particularly these businesses like a web service provider or a, a transaction a payment processor, they generally are less interested in what's being transacted. But then the government and like with things like sex work um, and uh, whatnot during the days when FOSTA and SESTA were being passed, which were attempts to, you know, people made a big uh, uh, hysteria about sex trafficking, online sex trafficking, and then the government passed laws restricting certain types or tried to, and, you know, and then, uh, you know, transaction payment processing companies get the message. So uh... having said that, again, you know, MasterCard and Visa, <laughs> kind of have, you know, near monopolies. Yeah. Sorry, it's, it's not monopolies, them, they have basically. large market shares. But other companies come up then, you know, Stripe comes up and- But uh, they you know, are in the same game. Yeah. They just had me right. open up my fantasy.com so that they could see what right. content was on there. But on another level, you, I mean, and this is where it gets dicey, right? Because you do want, like, you, you don't want to be forced to have on whoever 
you know, wants to come on your platform, right? right. You know, et cetera. And so like- No, I wouldn't want yeah. regulation. Yeah. I but, don't- But I agree that what we need to be building is, you know, there's there's law and there's custom. Right. And we're, what's really troubling now is that we are, um, you know, we're, we're in a lull of free speech, defense of free speech. And this is something, you know, again, I'm, I'm actually, I was born in 63, so I'm a late boomer and I didn't realize it really until the past couple of years. (laughs) That should be the title of your autobiography, (laughs) late boomer. (laughs) Uh, But I, I didn't realize that I had grown up in such a weird moment in history where, free speech was really fetishized to an, a, a ridiculous degree. Mm. And it, it was clamped down, you know, up through the early 60s. I mean, you couldn't even publish, um, you know, James Joyce's Ulysses or Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence legally right. until the early 60s. Um, and it's it's getting squeezed down again now. And what what I think we would all benefit from is a world where free speech as a cultural value is positive. And when you look at, you know, boomers and Gen X tend to be more in favor of free speech than millennials who are more in favor of free speech than Gen Z. And there's clearly a shift going on. And I think that's a battle worth having at all time. Well, that, you know, the minute you start to say somebody's uh, speech or expression rights should be constrained in the name of the public good, you are you have just put yourself in line for the guillotine. Right. I don't. Un- that's what I don't understand is the the thinking that when, because I see a lot of this movement coming from the speech is violence. Yeah. So that's how it's been positioned. Right. And if speech is violence, well, obviously the younger generations are going to yeah. say we shouldn't have free speech. Right. And I feel like that's coming before they're even learning about free speech. They're learning that speech is violence. Right. And so this, this kind of cultural trend mm-hmm. is catastrophic yeah it could be it you know really, that's really, one of the really trends really that be. i see as i mean the the, uh, the other thing that is good um is that this stuff does you know every action has a reaction and, right um you know and uh, you know so that the more absurd people get you say <laughs> like okay well we've got to shut things down uh, even if it's their right to you know like the seuss foundation you know, right that, that runs dr seuss's literary estate they're totally within their totally. rights to, you know, to pull. I, you know, and I, I got to tell you, like, I hate Dr. Seuss anyway. So, like, the, you know, <laughs> every like, pull book them of all. Her, yeah, you know, <laughs> an angel gets its wings every time, you know, one of his books. And especially, like, there was one of those, only one of those books to think I saw it on Mulberry Street, anybody had really ever heard of. Like, the other ones were, like, real lesser works. But... The minute, you know, they're within the right to do that, but then eBay starts delisting it. You can't right. really sell them on Amazon, right. et cetera. And it's like, I get that. And I also, I, I get that, you know, um, stereotypes are offensive and that uh, things change. But the more we start going on a hunt for everything that might somewhere somehow cause offense to somebody, you know, that's just like, it's a big waste of time. I, I believe in longevity. I believe, you know, that we're going to have breakthrough medicine and stuff that'll allow us all to live to be 200. And that's still, you don't have enough time to waste going after, oh, like the third <laughs> tier Dr. Seuss works, <laughs> you know, including just, all of his, you know, anti-Japanese World War II cartoons, which are truly offensive and racist. He apologized for them later. But you know, and, and maybe the Seuss Foundation shouldn't be selling them. But on another level, I don't know, maybe they shouldn't. It would be a better world where Japanese people, I mean, this happens with uh, a lot of African Americans collect old, you know, super racist advertisements and dolls and um, uh, lawn jockeys and stuff mm-hmm. as a sign of cultural power to show mm-hmm. where they came from. I bought, um, it's at a business now, there's this place called the Georgetown Book sh- Bookstore that had old uh, magazine covers and illustrations. And I bought like a bunch of anti-Italian and anti-Irish things because that's my heritage. And right. it's like, fuck you. You know, right. these were all from 1900 or thereabouts and they were attacking, you know, my ancestors. And, you know, I, I, and I'm not saying like you should, you know, we should actually be upping the production. We should be using, you know, the Emergency Production Act, you know, <laughs> forget vaccines. Let's put out, forget let's pump masks. out, yeah, let's pump out historically racist <laughs> artifacts. Collectibles. So that we, yeah. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying is like to have a world where, you know, people engage stuff and then, you know, and they, and they argue with stuff and, or they go on their own way. But instead of having to, 
you know, shut Disappear down everything. It. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is what we, this is basically what dumpster fire is every yeah. week yeah. because there's so much low hanging fruit. And yeah. I'm the same with Dr. Seuss. I had a good conversation with someone. I'm like, it's, I get it. I understand it's well within their rights. I t- understand maybe they were not great sellers. No right. one had heard of them. And, but what always chills me is the panel, you know, and I was talking yeah. to a conservative Jeff Charles and he's like, there's always a panel. You know? yeah. and I'm like, yeah. that's what's chilling is yeah. that this is the inquisition that's right. coming yeah, for the us. Star chamber, and yeah. you can't really point to it because it's always like, but it's a private business, right. but it's a private business. Yeah. And this is what is terrifying to me as someone who is pretty libertarian and in yeah. this respect is that that, but the, it's a private business but there's a panel and it's like the inquisition that's making these decisions or forcing them is something that's insidious and terrifying. Yeah. And even with like the Dumbo thing that happened and all Mm -hmm. those Disney movies, I was like, get rid of Dumbo because it sucks, but don't get rid of it because I, uh, I'm a fan of the uh, original Dumbo. And I say (laughs) that, you know, because it's, you know, it like a great Disney movie. It's about a, a child being ripped away from its mother <laughs> all of their father. <laughs> well no but i mean it's really good but it is when you're watching it it's you know it is unbelievably fucked up yeah again you know and maybe disney doesn't have to uh you know i i mean on a certain level like the song of the south is the movie that disney has successfully disappeared it's mm. very hard to find a copy of it because it is you know, by most accounts totally offensive right and you know i guess it is but on another level this is also something where both the right and the left, I think, want to focus more and more attention because it then it keeps us from having actually provocative and interesting conversations about like how to make the world better now. Because right. like, to be quite honest, this type of stuff is, you know, and the Dr. Seuss stuff is small ball. Right. You know, it just is. And it's like we have massive government deficits. We right. Have, you know, we have business regulations where for the past year, the government at various levels has gotten to say, you're an essential business. You can stay open. You're not. You can't. I mean, I, right. I, lived, I, I was in New York and like a Kmart was able to stay open because it had food and a pharmacy and clothing. And so you could buy clothing there, but other clothing stores for like six months couldn't be right, open. Right, no, it's it ridiculous. Like, this is the stuff we should be talking about. And we should also be making sure that we're talking about you know, the speech that is really important um, and and where we're getting across the ideas of how do we build the worlds we want to live in. So I get kind of annoyed. You know, the Republicans did spend a lot of time talking about Dr. Seuss as this $2 trillion piece of crap bill was being passed that's lining the pocket of every American. I wish, you know, that they had spent more time successfully uh, you know, stopping that as, yeah. as, you know, going, you know, if I see Ted Cruz or Kevin McCarthy read Green Eggs and Ham one more time, you know, I'm just, I'm going to lose it. Yeah. Tell me about teen, you're yeah. working for Teen well, Magazine. I know, you know, you had said to prepare stories of grit and resilience at, uh, you know, as uh, like inspirational tales. And I guess, so let me preface the teen mag stuff uh, just by talking about like I I grew up lower middle class in New Jersey and what that meant was that I my parents my father had not graduated high school uh, my mother had barely graduated high school and she worked as a bookkeeper my father worked as an office manager for a shipping com- shipping company but by the time I got a full time you know co- post college job I was like making more than my parents wow. Which, and I, you know, I, I didn't lack for anything growing up, but I, the one thing that it did, and this gets to the question of grit, grit and resilience, I think, is that like, I knew if I wanted to have a world, if I wanted to have a life that I wanted to have, like I was going to have to kind of build it, mm-hmm. you know, um, because my parents didn't have connections. They didn't have, you know, they didn't have the experience to be able, and nobody in my uh, extended family had the experience to say like, oh, you want to go into writing, you should do this or that, or I can put you in touch with my friend, the writer or anything like that. And as a result early on, and what they both did um, kind of instill in me pretty well was a sense like everybody you meet is probably going to be as smart as you or maybe a little bit smarter. Like you're not going to be the smartest person in the room, but you can always work hard. Right. And, and that's like a huge leveler wow. of everything. And so as a result of that, like I really looked for opportunities and I would always show up, you know, like to a job, I would show up a little bit early mm-hmm. and I would stay a little bit late and I would try and do as, as as good as possible because I've never had a job that I could afford to lose right. uh, for any number of reasons. Um, and also just kind of existentially, like I've realized, uh, and I, I chalked this up 
as much as anything to growing up in New Jersey. I was born in Brooklyn, but I grew up in New Jersey and I love New Jersey as a state. I never want to live there. Again. Right. I like to visit every once in a while, but it is a place where you know everybody shits on New Jersey. People who live there shit on New Jersey. It's not New York, it's not Philadelphia. You know, it's it's you know, toxic waste dumps and all of this. And you realize pretty soon that the world is at best indifferent to you and at worst is like actively hostile. So mm -hmm. like you've got to make your way in the world. And that created in me, I think, or, or I built out of that an ethic of, you know, of hard work and constantly pushing mm -hmm. for stuff. And that's has served me pretty well. And so was one of your early jobs at a teen yes. magazine? Yeah, yeah. So what happened was I graduated from college and I had I, I was an English major and a psychology major. And so, you know, I had no obvious skills, and, but I could write a little bit. I'd been on the college newspaper writing about entertainment most. And I worked for some newspapers and stuff. I worked at a bunch of factory jobs. Actually, my, my greatest uh, probably learning experiences for a while. I worked at a Johnson and Johnson personal products factory that made panty liners. Oh, wow. So I know, you know, I have seen the inside of Oz, <laughs> you know, and it was like a, a very strange and kind of wonderful experience. Um, and among other things, it made me realize like I wanted to get out of manual labor as quick as possible. This mm -hmm. is, you know, it's, it's better to work with your mind and your mouth than, uh, you know, and I, and I guess that would include sex work then. You know, yeah. working in a factory. It's hard on your body yeah. working. Yes. Working on your feet or on yeah. your back or any any of those physical labor yeah, jobs. Yeah, it really is. And it, you know, uh, but uh, so then I ended up uh, looking at the New York Times and I got, uh, I worked at a couple of companies uh, and I was, I guess, like 22, 23 in Manhattan that published teen magazines. One was, one of the teen magazines I worked on was called Teen Machine, which is like <laughs> just a horribly semi-pornographic title. Um, and uh, this would have been in like the mid '80s, like '86. Were those like those old Beat magazines? Yeah, 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 yeah. Teen Beat. Uh, I also worked the one of the sister publications at this company that doesn't exist anymore. It was Super Teen, which was actually kind of a semi-top tier teen magazine. Teen Machine was not. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I, there, I also worked for a uh, magazine called. Uh, My Modern Screen, which was the oldest, I don't think it's published anymore. It had been, it started in like 1930 and it was the oldest movie mag, um, which was kind of great. But these were horrible fan magazines and stuff. At Teen Machine for a year, I, I wrote an advice column as Alyssa Milano. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I never, I never <laughs> Does met Alyssa her. Does know this? <laughs> no, she, I've never met her, I interacted with her in any way, shape, that or form. That is hilarious. But I was her voice of Team Machine for the better part of the year. And I, uh, you know, I'm kind of like by court order, I have to apologize for that spurt of uh, teen pregnancies that is in 1986 so when girls writing in asking if they should go all the way, of, of course. <laughs> um, but so I got to see... Uh, you know, it was it was a hilarious kind of world. And then I worked at another publication or another company um, that was run by the guy who ended up developing Maxim and oh, Grindr yeah. in the week. Felix Dennis yep. is a British uh, yep. publishing legend who died a few years ago. I wanted to work at Maxim so yeah. badly he, when I f that was my dream was to have a column there. He had, uh, you would have been perfect for that. I mean, that's I actually exactly, that would have been, that would have saved it, right? I yeah. have my proposal still that I wrote yeah. for Max and why they should hire me. So when <laughs> I worked for him, he was doing, he had, he had made his money um, doing Kung Fu magazines in the early 70s. Oh, wow. So he'd been involved in an underground publication called Oz in the late 60s in England that actually got sued for child pornography. It was a totally trumped up charge and John Lennon cut a, a benefit record for them and stuff. But then he he kind of sold out and and made a mint publishing Bruce Lee Kung Fu magazines. I'm and he created a, a Mac user, um, which was the first Macintosh oh, magazine wow. and Mac Warehouse, which was a catalog. Uh, but I met him at like kind of the nadir of his uh, Ugh, publishing Maxim career. Maxim was so good when yeah. it was good. Yeah, th this was before that. And uh, he also published a thing called uh, Star Hits and then Smash Hits, which was a licensed version of an English pop magazine mm -hmm. that was like new wave and punk stuff that I, um, I wrote for as well as Wow and Hot, I think. 
all of the teen magazines were like, wow, exclamation point. Uh, H-A-W-T. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and I interviewed people like uh, John Stamos and Corey Feldman. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Wow, these are the magazines I was reading. Yeah, on the rock You were writing side, for them. Yeah, on the, on the you know, rock side, I got, I interviewed, every, you know, tons of people like, uh, you know, people from, uh, you know, bands like New Order and uh, wow. uh, Ozzy Osbourne, one, you know, I interviewed him one time. And uh, so was, was this like 90, 91? This was actually like 86 to 80. Okay. I guess. And um and it, and Kirk Cameron was Kirk yep. Cameron was like the colossus of TV magazines when I was there. And it was already declining because Michael J. Fox was like a real star. Kirk Cameron was, you know, he was the biggest of his day, but it, you know, it's like after uh there was like Doogie Hauser, he was huge yeah, too. Neil Patrick Harris, who has the perfect thing where you always want a, a teen star should like Lee Harvey Oswald, they should have three first names. <laughs> You know, that's yeah. like Neil Patrick Harris. But um, Kirk Cameron was like a lesser, you know, it was like after Muhammad Ali, there was a dip in the heavyweight boxing world. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. he was not, he wasn't Muhammad Ali. He was, you know, uh, Larry um, Holmes or something. But <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and it was, uh, I, I got to see a lot of uh, ambition, right. you know, on the part of people because all of these teen stars and it's really, it's really the people that don't make it, but that are kind of nipping around the edges where you see the, you know, you see the desperation and you see the game plan and the blueprint. And, you know, it was, it was kind of interesting and kind of disturbing all at the same time. And it also gave me a great appreciation for how manufactured, I was going to say fake, but that's wrong. How manufactured so much of what we talk about and how we present things mm. are. Um, so I mentioned, I, I worked for modern, modern screen mm -hmm. magazine, this old movie fanzine, you know, and in the, the library, the, the photo library, they had these old photo shoots. They, they were one of the magazines that published these Joan Crawford pictures of, you know, photo essays of her with her adopted children having perfect picnics in her backyard. Oh, wow. You know, that was later, yeah. right around that time was being revealed where she would like beat them and things like <laughs> that. And so, you know, it was a kind of wonderful education to see, you know, the image and what goes into it and also the people who don't make it. I mean, I interviewed dozens of, you know, pop bands and rock acts and stuff and like, Every one of them said the same thing, you know, like I, you know, there was, there was a group called Shelley and Orphan, I remember, which you've never heard of. And they were like a post, uh, you know, uh, new romantic, post-punk kind of band, new wave. And they were like, you know, we're going to redefine pop music, <laughs> you know, for, for good. And it's like, no, you're not. Yeah. You know? And like, you would see that. And everybody had the same stories of like, I was an outcast in high school and in grammar school, and now I'm a god, you know, et cetera. And so it, that was very um, instructive for me. What did you take from it? Um, one that I wanted to get out and I wanted to go to grad school, uh -huh. so, uh, <laughs> which has its own problem. And then I saw in academia, you know, when you, when you're talking about great authors, people are still acting as fans basically. Right. And it's also a lot of fakery and, and BS, but, but in another way that almost anything was possible because mm. like I kind of drifted into things because again, I think one of the things, and I hadn't, I, I was thinking about this in preparation for this. One of the benefits, uh, there, there are no benefits to growing up, you know, kind of poor or lower middle class, I would say, you know, realistically, because any insights that you have from that condition, you can get while being fabulously wealthy. But one of the things that was like, I didn't have a plan uh, for anything for my life. And I, you know, I had a lot of energy, I had some ambition, and I had, you know, some skills, and, and I wouldn't say talent, it's like skills. It's like, anybody can learn to write pretty well, anybody mm -hmm. can learn to show up on time, anybody can learn how to ask questions. Mm -hmm. You know, these are, you know, and, um, but seeing people who were trying, you know, desperately, to be great at what they did or be important. And, and, you know, there's a narcissism there, you know, particularly in a lot of acting, especially if you're right. 12 years old, a lot of it, you're being pushed by your parents or, you know, if you're a rock star and you're delusional, right. you know, that your message is, you know, need the world needs to hear it. But it really made me think about like, okay, you know, you need to take control of your life and, you know, you never have a plan, you know, John Lennon, 
uh, obviously before he was shot to death, you know, he said fame or in, um, one of the songs on double fantasy, there's the line, life is what happens when you're making other plans. Right. But it actually really matters to have a plan. Like, cause mm. if you don't have a plan, nothing is going to happen. And it may be totally different than what you want it to happen. Right. But you need to be kind of thoughtful in those kind of ways. And you know, that I'm happy for, because I think in a way, if I can, you know, just delusionally transfer my experience to a larger socialist uh, kind of condition. I think what, uh, in a lot of ways, if you grow up comfortable, if you grow up where it's taken for granted that you matter in the world, mm -hmm. you know, as a person, like mm -hmm. that, that, that the world cares about whether you live or die or whether you thrive. If you grow up assuming that, you might be less likely to actually start doing stuff and mm. like take advantage of all that's around you. And I think in a lot of ways, socially, we're almost like culturally, we're almost there because for me, and this is, I think back to my, my grandparents all came over, you know, from Italy and Ireland and they were super poor in the, uh, like around 1915 plus or minus a few years. And they got here, they had shit jobs and then the depression hit. Right. You know, they ended up okay, most of them anyway. And then, you know, my parents grew up as immigrant kids, poor, really poor in the twenties, very poor in the thirties. You know, my father was the luckiest thing that ever happened to him was World War II and he got drafted mm -hmm. and you know, he fought in Normandy and, you know, it's like he had a purple heart and stuff, but it got him out of his little world right. into a slightly bigger world. But they were, um, you know, culturally, I have a strong sense of how, like, one beat away I was from poverty. Right. And from just nothing. Um, and I feel like culturally, like, I know my kids are growing up much better off than I did. And not just materially, but they know that there's a broader world out there. My sons have traveled more than I have, uh, you know, and they're, you know, not even out of their 20s yet. And um, I feel... America in general has become, we've become a wealthier, better place, you know, across the board, but we haven't necessarily remembered, like, you know, this can all go away. Yeah, that's the like, weird yeah. thing. Yeah. You that know, is, it's, I would, I always say, I feel like America is like a trust fund baby. Like it's yeah. a third, because, and all I read from millennials is how bad they have it. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I see, and now I hear this from Gen Z and they're like, mm -hmm. oh, you people are screwing us over. Right. And in some ways, I do think that there hasn't been any larger instance of like intergenerational theft ever. <laughs> right, yeah. No, and I, they're right. And that's still unfolding. I and, mean, boomers and, like me, are sucking a ton of money our way, you know, right. and, and not just money, but also jobs, you know, right. It's one of the most amazing things. And like, you know, I think Joe Biden is senile, like I, I, you know, and I think Donald Trump has mental decline, Hillary Clinton. But another thing is, you know, they're all like in their 70s and right. they're running the country. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is 80. I know. You know it's like the I Soviet make this joke Union. all the time. Yeah, the Soviet Union. We thought they had a gerontocracy when, you know, like Mikhail Gorbachev, you know, I don't know, what was he, like 55 yeah. or 60, you know, and it's like, we were, yeah, we're, we're blocking, you know, the kind of ascent of younger people in bad ways. But having said that, I didn't have a phone yeah. that was a thousand dollars when yeah. I was 11 right. or 12, like yeah. my nephew does. And like more computing power than all the pharaohs of Egypt can <laughs> yeah. launch, you know? and, and they're, t they're turning their brains yeah. into pudding with TikTok. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, and it's weird because I do think that sense of, um, you know, and I, I, I worry when, uh, I don't like it when people invoke entitlement as a bad thing, because I think people are entitled to certain basic you know, you're definitely uh, entitled to basic rights and kind of basic respect. But there is when, you know, if you grow up very comfortably um, and, and, and it's all about status as opposed to just doing stuff, people get envious and they start eroding the base upon which everything mm. functions, you know, and this is where you were talking about Burning Man before about like, you know, it's a barter economy once you get there, but it takes a lot of money <laughs> yeah, to get there. To, to, and that's kind of the way the world is now. And like, we can fuck that up. Like we, the, the, the riches that make it, you know, make Burning Man possible can disappear. This happens all the time. I always think, when my Italian grandfather, um, he basically he had him and a couple of brothers were told to leave Italy for good um, when World War One was coming because his father said, you know, you guys are just going to be human, you know, uh, uh, ammunition here. Get out! And they had been going to either Argentina or America f uh, and like doing labor there and bringing money back to Italy. It's very common because Italy was poor. 
And the smart people in his family went to Argentina because in the 19 teens, it was a richer country and it was more welcoming to Italians. Mm -hmm. And my Italian grandfather was stupid, so he came to America. <laughs> but, you know, it, it ended up working out. And my point is that, like, in 1915 or something, like, it, you would have you would have said, I want Argentina will never be poor. And Argentina has been a shit show, you know, for right. 80 years, 90 years. Right. And it does you know, and it's better than other places, but it's not what it should be. And, like, we can lose our wealth, which is what makes everything happen. And if we you know, if we get lazy, if we get self like solipsistic, where all we're talking about is how bad and rotten, how somebody somewhere has more than I do right. at this minute. So we have to flatten that as opposed to saying, okay, let's create a world where more people can do, they can discover who they are. Right. They can move to where they want to move, where they can, yeah. And again, they can eat what they want to eat. They can smoke what they want to smoke. They can think and say what they want, you know, what they believe. I mean, that's a better world. And to the extent that we fuck that up, either through speech codes and like cultural mores that are just awful or laws and regulation and government spending and taxes and regulation, you know, that's a, that's very, very, very disturbing. Yeah. I mean, and it all ties back to me being a teen magazine. <laughs> I would never have known this, you know, if I hadn't interviewed Corey Feldman and Corey Haim. I mean, yeah, you would learn a lot yeah. from interviewing those two I think so. <laughs> about and squandering I say this, wealth. <laughs> I am like Philippe Petit, you know, the the aerialist who walked between the twin towers. It can never be done again. I am like that with the Twa Quarries. <laughs> Nobody will ever be able to interview both of them ever again. It's true. Wow, uh, I still have so many questions, so, but I've already taken. I don't know what your time limit I, is. Lay it on me. I'm, okay. I'm, I, uh, I the other thing is like a fish. You know, I uh, or no, I guess that doesn't make sense. I was going to say, I always o overstay my welcome. No. So, you know, but yeah, like, go ahead. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Getting a good night's sleep can be hard to come by. We're overcaffeinated, addicted to our screens, and living in an overstimulating world, to say the least. When you run on too little sleep, it can take a serious toll on your mental and physical health. That's why we're excited to partner with Calm, the mental fitness app designed to help you relieve anxiety and improve your sleep. And if you go to calm.com slash walkin, You'll get a limited time offer of 40% off a Calm Premium subscription, which includes hundreds of hours of programming. The sleep story I listened to this week was Sunset on the Savannah, exploring the wonders of the wilderness on an unforgettable African safari in Kenya by Timothy Alexander White. Coming back from South Africa, being on safari, missing the feeling of traveling and just being outside of my element and in a completely different environment, surrounded by so much natural beauty and quiet and no Wi-Fi. It instantly relaxed me. I couldn't sleep. It was a full moon. And I just was drifting off. And yeah, it just worked like a charm. For listeners of the show, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash walkin. That's 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library and new content is added every week. Get started today at calm.com slash walkin. That's calm.com slash walkin. What do you think about the modern state of journalism as someone who's been in yeah. this industry for a long time? For a thousand years, yeah. Um, I, since, you know, since Corey, you were interviewing Corey Haim. The one thing I would say is like, with the exception of, um, I, I was a columnist for a few years at Time Magazine and at the Daily Beast. And mm -hmm. those are probably the only kind of like mainstream media that I've been involved with. And obviously the fact that I was a columnist at Time uh, time.com was a sign that, you know, the legacy media was dead. Right. I mean, like, if they're letting me write there, you know, it's over. Um, and it, in a real sense, it was. And it, and it is over for time. You know, it doesn't matter anymore. I think the when we talk about the state of journalism, broadly speaking, or media or something like that, or words, I, I don't know what the right phrase is. We're actually in kind of a great period. Because th to me, what matters, can more people... Uh, engage in more conversation and kind of more publishing than ever. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, 
everything is going gangbusters because it's easier for people to kind of put their stuff out there and build an audience and gain an audience to do the kinds of investigations that wouldn't happen otherwise and things like that. Um, so in that sense, and I think a lot of this is technologically driven and also economically in the sense that, you know, um, local newspapers, you know, the LA Times is a good example, which is going up on the chopping block again. Um, you know, it for so long, it was just a fat, super profitable and lazy newspaper right. because it had a hundred percent market share of advertising dollars which is all you needed now they're struggling because advertising has gone elsewhere right and so for a lot of legacy media groups uh you know things are bad what's happening at the new york times the new york times effectively has changed from an advertising model to a subscription model so, you know, they are, they're run by a bunch of people who are becoming increasingly woke and increasingly right. ideological at the expense of good journalism. Right. But their readers, their subscribers might want that. So I wouldn't be surprised if they get more and more extreme and profitable and they matter less and less. And I'm right. kind of happy with that. Okay. Um, you know, same thing with cable news, you know, uh, broadcast news used to, you know, I mean, like fucking people like Walter Cronkite, who sucks, by the way. And anytime anybody's like, oh, you know, I wish we lived in a world where we had newsmen like Walter Cronkite. Like, why? Walter <laughs> Cronkite was an idiot. You know, and he was anti-drugs. He, 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 he's just like awful. He's a blowhard. He just had a massive market because right. there was nothing else on TV. Right. Like, what? It's a great world that nobody, you know, that nobody knows who he is or Ed Sullivan or something yeah. like that. You know, but that got supplanted by cable news. Cable news is now being destroyed by people like you who have built these flourishing ecosystems where the, the talk shows are better on YouTube and on Patreon and on, you know, whatever. Uh, and a lot of the, uh, you know, that's all good. So I, in a weird way, I need to say, or I want, I feel a need to say that this is the golden age. Like, right. If there is one, this is it. <laughs> And then, you know, what that also means is there's a lot of crap out there mm -hmm. and what we, you know, what we need to do, and we all have our own definitions of what is crap, what is good, mix it up more and make more and make more. I mean, this is like, you know, it's the Obama had the cheesy Gandhi quote that he was channeling, you know, be the change you want to see right. in the world. And it's like, it's really easy to be the change you want to see in the media. Um, right. If, if you actually make you know, if you do journalism, if you make media, as opposed to just bitching and moaning and saying, you know what, I need, I need more representation of my ideas or my scripts in the Oscars or this right. or that. Like if it's, you know, and and again, I'm not saying people should out. You know, if there is systemic racism, if there is systemic sexism, certainly, you know, and stuff like call it out. You know, but it's like mostly build your own shit. Right. You know? This is what I always say to conservatives. I'm gl yeah. I'm gr glad to see the Daily Wire because for years, ever since I stumbled into this space, I'm like, all conservatives do is bitch. Yeah. Just like make your own stuff. Yeah. The Babylon Bee is a great example. The of Babylon this. Bee, and I've uh, you know I've interviewed the uh, the editor in chief there. Uh, they are fantastic, and I like. You know, that they um, put the handicap on, too, that they have to be Bible-believing Christians. Right. I mean, they believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Yeah. So that's like, you know, chopping off all of your limbs and then, you know, going into a fight or something. I know. And, and it's really and they're funny really good and at really it. inventive. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about this, you know, kind of the Substack revolution with journalism where... I'm all I have weird mixed feelings about it because I'm all for it in some respects. I, I think mm -hmm. it's great. Everybody this was inevitable. But it's I like having an editor. Yeah. So now you have if someone doesn't have an editor. Yeah, of course. They're terrible. I mean, this it, every You're industry, also just it's more of like an opinion. Right. It's not necessarily well, I had an yeah. editor for my opinions, but now as I'm reading journalists, I'm like, oh, this is just out of their brain. Right. You know? <laughs> it's really <laughs> fascinating because, you know, you can look at movies, you can look at novels, you can look at music where acts get so big that, you know, the the corporation or the industry that was supporting them can no longer edit them or produce them. And so, you know, like like there's there's a reason why the you know the Beatles solo records tend to get shittier and shittier partly because they no longer nobody could nobody could tell them you know what that 
just sucks. doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Like give us, okay, what's, what's the next song you wrote, you know, or something like that. And that happens a lot with rock acts. Sometimes they're better, you know, when they have no oversight and it doesn't have to be corporate oversight or anything. It's like, you know, where they have reliable sounding boards where they're trying to make better art rather than just do whatever they're going to do. Right. That happens in novels or, or, or in fiction writers get, you know, they're bad self editors often. I think it's very true with journalism and with writers in Substack. What's great about Substack is that it has allowed, you know, again, this right of exit, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which yep. is really important. And it allows every, everybody to build their, uh, you know, their own uh, burning man, right. you know, online and stuff like that. There is going to come a time, and it may be coming soon, where Substack is going to start saying like, you know, we're a platform that allows anybody to engage directly with audiences. And then they're going to be like, you know, Bridget, uh, you know, you're kind of... Uh, you're kind of iffy on some things we believe, so get off. You right. Know, that's going to happen. I think it's instructive when you look at people like uh, Glenn Greenwald is a great example where he was a individual blogger that he read for Salon and then The Guardian, and then he you know, created Started the Intercept. Started Intercept, yep. And then basically got squeezed or left The Intercept because they were like, you know, Glenn, you're not our kind of guy. Right. You know, after five years, it's it's pretty great. And he's on Substack and he's doing great stuff. Could probably use an editor, right? Um, although I I like the unrestrained Glenn mm. Greenwald, but uh, but then beyond all of this, it's also there's another question of like, let's say every Substack costs five bucks, you know. Well, this uh, is what I yeah. was saying. There's <laughs> there's like, like a I, how this much, is a bubble. Yeah, how much am I going to spend on individual people? Yeah. And then it's like, I, and I've heard people uh, you know talk about this, uh, which is funny, where they'll be like, oh well, you know what we should do is pull together and right. like and then you know you pay one price and you can read all of these right so you're like, like oh, so, so you're, you're a gonna, network yeah you're gonna make a magazine yeah or something. and then it's like <laughs> and then all those people are gonna you're gonna be a super group right you know you're gonna be like cream or you know derek and the dominoes and yeah. then like within an album you're gonna hate each other yeah and you know so it's i think it's good but it's 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 not the end state you know, and, and there probably is no end state where we're going to be looking for a lot of ways to, you know, kind of find a place uh, that allows more people to reach more audiences. But, you know, right now, there's a ton of great stuff on Substack. Right. Um, and it's a great refugee. It's like a halfway house. Yeah. Because it's great, you know, that somebody like Glenn Greenwald gets booted. Barry Weiss leaves the New York Times yep. and can land there and, and then has, it's easier to reach people. I love that, you know, all of the founders of Vox you know, have essentially been kicked out by their, yeah, you know, I know. their malformed children you know, who were raised <laughs> as like intellectual human veal. And they're yeah. like, get out. You, know, you, you are ruining the nest that you birthed <laughs> us in. You know, it's like, um, you know, and most of or a bunch of them are at um, Substacks. And some, some of them are at, at the, the Times, times yeah. yeah. Which again, uh, you know, the most important thing is kind of like, it's not whether or not individual things are good or bad, but is there a flourishing ecosystem? And I think there is. Um, and for me, this is, it, it crosses most parts of, of American life where more people are comfortable being weird or being themselves. More people can live in more places. Uh, you know, so it's it's good. But but there are always these threats around the edges. Yeah, it's, it's I love it. Like, I think it's, I've always I said- I think I'm more optimistic. Than I'm you. super optimistic until I'm not. Yeah. So th I, it's like it extends to a moment when I'm looking at what my exposure is to risk yep. and ha making up backup plans. Like, right. okay, if I inevitably get kicked off Twitter, where am I going? You yeah. know, which is my pipeline for right. XYZ? Well, How are people going to find me? Parlor, no, right? I'm not no, doing no, that. Yeah. Um, I it's, it's so yeah, there's that kind of always yeah. fear when you're pushing the edges yeah. and saying things that are somewhat common sense and sometimes just saying right. things like retard just because I think it's funny yeah. and people get so mad yeah. and pushing back against the, right. like what I, f what I feel is this encroachment on free speech right. uh, everywhere. Yeah. And eventually I'll probably lose that fight. I just always say on dumpster fire, I'm like, I'm going to yeah. talk as long as I can. <laughs> yeah, no. And I think, but I think doing that is part of the evolutionary process or, or liberating process because you know, what happens, like, if you give up um, before you're asked to leave, before you're shut right. the door, then it, you know, then it, things get darker quicker. 
And I think, you know, this is, I also think, I mean, like you're doing fabulously well and you should be. And it's like, there's a broad audience out there right. for a lot of this stuff. And this is also like, you know, free speech and society and, you know, kind of change. It's, it isn't like, okay, you know, if we just, if we can cross that river, you know, then we're in the free world, right? right. Like communist Russia. It's like, no, it isn't like that. There, there's no, there's no secret valley there, you know, to use a libertarian trope. There's no Galt's Gulch, you know, like the, <laughs> yeah. whatever, uh, you know, I, I've never finished Atlas Shrugged, uh, <laughs> nor do I expect to again. I'll only live to 200. So, people but, keep you know, telling I, me to read it. I, I, I mean, I know so many people that are so different, including a bunch of lefties. I mean, and, you know, people like um, Oliver Stone loves Atlas Shrugged. Right. You know, it's like, so it's, there's something about, but, you know, there's this concept in it of Galt's Gulch where all the productive people in the world, they go on strike and, you know, and because they're getting you know, too much of their productivity is being taken from them there. So they're like, fuck it, we're going to go build our hidden valley and, you know, like make salad dressing and <laughs> railroads made out of, you know, vibranium and all of this kind of stuff, reared in steel. Um, you know, but that doesn't exist in the real world. Right. I mean, you, there's ne it's never an end point, which is both exciting and energizing. It means like you're going to be working all the time, but it's also exhausting. Yeah, the, I mean, there's no there there. We have this ongoing joke of we must feed the algorithm because that's right. essentially what happens. Yeah. And once you yeah. start this engine, now, and you know when you finally get to the you know to the engine of the runaway train and you open the door <laughs> that says algorithm and it's just like a bunch of rats eating wires. So it's yeah, like, it's yeah, uh, um, and that is something you know that I think is also kind of fascinating is some of this stuff is automated or it has the appearance of being automated, but like. The algorithm, you know, it doesn't exist. It's like, you know, people at Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and whatnot, they, they're they using, you know, coding and stuff like that, but they're they're putting English on everything. You know, they're directing things. Yeah. I mean, uh, the self-learning algorithms are terrifying, but yeah, yeah. they. I, I just read this long form piece about Facebook and mm -hmm. I was like, I've never been so scared in my life of Facebook or the algorithm mm -hmm. and how essentially they don't even know how to can get control of their own algorithm. I, I <laughs> find that though kind of deeply mm -hmm. um, comforting. I was raised Catholic and I remember, I guess this was in like the 80s. There were, you know, there were, it was a big banking scandal that uh, ensnared the Vatican. But at some point in the 80s, the Vatican um, did an audit of everything that, you know, the Catholic Church owned. And it turned out like they owned condom factories it's crazy. and things like that. And they were like, wow, this is. And that's what's great about empires mm. is that empires, you know, of all sorts, they create, you know, they, they try to maintain total control, but there's all of these weird you know, shadow spaces and garages, you know, where people can <laughs> like just, <mine. laughs> yeah, can just kind of like, you know, figure out ways to escape. And the important thing too, and this is something where I think the left is really bad. Um, they, they are pushing a series of arguments. Uh, oftentimes it, it, it's about race or white supremacism or sexism or the way capitalism degrades people, but they have this totalized system view where it's like, you know, there is an empire out there. It's capital or it's, you know, patriarchy or it's white supremacism and it's totally effective and it's covering every thing and it's like in fact that's not true right you know and it's like you 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 have to fight against systems that are purely evil like the soviet union but even within that there were all of these loopholes and retreats where people could find and we don't live in that kind of world we live in a world that is you know in a system and this is what's great about america at its best is that it's a very loose system which isn't ultimately it kind of like if you knock on the door you know, if you do it enough, it it budges a little bit and you can force your way in. And like <laughs> you can change, you can you can get to where you want to be, you can become who you want to be, you can change the culture in a way. You know, I have friends who are gay and I remember this from the 80s and I was in, working and living in New York in the 80s during the AIDS, uh, you know, the high yeah, of AIDS yeah. and stuff like that. And it's like, when you look at, you know, where gay culture has gone in terms of being accepted, being part of, you know, and celebrated, um, being able to deal with everything that gets thrown at it from, you know, say like 1969, the Stonewall yep. riot to now. And it, you know, it doesn't mean everything is perfect, but it's like, wow, that's pretty great. That's, a, uh, yeah, a lot of progress. Women, women in the workplace, a lot of progress, uh, uh, blacks, Latinos. 
Uh, you know, in, in many, many instances, there's a huge amount of progress and it doesn't mean, okay, like, so let's We're take done. the next decade off or yeah. anything. Um, but it does mean that change is totally possible and, and it happens quickly. And I think one of the things that libertarianism, just to drag it back to that corpse uh, and handcuff it, you know, to that corpse, <laughs> um, but it also brings an appreciation of individualism. And what we are now is, you know, 50 years ago or 100 years ago, you know, say, um, you know, there were three types of people you would meet in high school. If you were a boy, you know, you could be a jock a nerd or a hood, right? Right. You know, like a criminal. Now there are, you know, dozens of possibilities because we're actually constantly recombining and mongrelizing and changing and, you know, and there's more acceptance of that and it's, it allows us to express ourselves more fully. So you don't have to be gay or straight, you know, like your sexuality doesn't define you. Your color doesn't define you. Your class doesn't define you. Your region doesn't define you and on and on. And this I think is, you know, this was part of the internet dream in the uh, early 90s and mid 90s as the web became a mass medium that we could have mass personalization of everything. And I think we would do well to kind of nurture that idea because it would allow us to, in, you know, engage with each other in fairer ways and in more respectful ways, but in more interesting ways. And like, you know, suddenly we're going to have a lot more options than if we're saying, okay, we can only talk about things in these categories, you know, or this category, or only this matters. Do you think that there's hope for a third party? Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, yeah, I, and, and the reason I say that in a decade ago, almost, yeah, I guess it was actually Even with the ago. kind of rise of more and more people identifying as independent? Yeah, I, you know, uh, well, here's why. Or it's, uh, I wrote a book with Matt Welch, my reason colleague, called The Declaration of Independence, How Libertarian Politics Can save america or something like that uh, actually i think it is can save america um and obviously that book was never read because here we are 10 years later <laughs> you know, america is finished, my first question right? for yeah. you is going to be how do we save america yeah, i know well <laughs> but um it started from the point that then a record number of people were identifying as independents politically that's true more true now but uh what happens in american politics and it's partly because of the way we do elections here and i don't think this is going to change nor I'm, I'm not you know, I don't know that it should, but you tend to have two dominant parties. Mm -hmm. What those parties are can change and definitely what they can stand for changes. Cause like the Republican party now doesn't even resemble the Republican party from 10 years ago. No, it's much. crazy. And if you go back, you know, like a hundred years, the democratic party under Grover Cleveland was pretty libertarian. They were mm -hmm. like free trade, anti, anti foreign war. Uh, they were pro civil rights, uh, you know, and they were pro business. And, you know, that, that doesn't describe the, um, you know, the democratic party now, uh, et cetera. So I think what will happen is that we are, we're in what I call the long 20th century where, we're still kind of being governed by a lot of the rules, a lot of the corporations, a lot of the mindset that was hashed out in the 20th century, especially after World War II, mm -hmm. including the Democratic and Party, uh, Democratic and Republican parties kind of were built as coalitions. Parties don't make sense. I mean, there, there's no real you know, a coherence to them. They, they have an ideology to cover up the fact that they're random assortments of people who have banded together to achieve political. Ends. Right. And what those groups are just don't make sense anymore. Like, you know, the, you know, the democratic party, you know, had something to do with like the working class. So they, you know, and, um, you know, and they were kind of anti-race, you know, they were anti-black for a long time, but then they started bringing them in. It's like, who are they speaking to? The, the the bundle of issues that they put together doesn't make sense to voters. So they right. can't win a large and sustainable majority. Same thing with the Republicans. So those parties will change. Maybe they'll die. Maybe new ones will take their place. But there will always be two major parties. Mm. Because in America, what you need to win is you know 50% plus one vote. And that means you need big organizations as opposed to in, in kind of European or parliamentary systems where you might have 15 parties that are much more spread out ac across the spectrum. So I think the, the, the real breakthrough will be for the political party that realizes that people, and I think this is somewhat true and part of it is aspirational on my part, but whichever party says, you know what, we're going to do less things. So 
uh, but we're going to do them well, and we're going to spend less money, and we're going to bother you less, that that will actually pull a large number of people together because then you don't have to agree with everybody else in the party about everything. You right. only have to agree on like three or four things. And so if you're the party that says, I'm going to guarantee abortion rights. Like, I'm, you know, we're not going to try and take that away. And we're going to let you, um, we're going to let you, your kid go to whatever school you want. Like, we're going to do vouchers. We're not going to invade foreign countries, et cetera. Like, you know, there's actually a lot of people that would fit that. We're going to legalize right. drugs, maybe not because we think drug use is good, but because prohibition causes more problems than it solves. Like, that is actually conceivably going to get a lot of people as opposed to if you're in the Republican party, you can't really be pro choice. Right. You know, and if you're in the democratic party, you can't be pro life. Right. You know, like there are these yeah. just, yeah. Single you know, issues. So, yeah. And so like, it's, it's hard to stay in those parties, which is why smaller and smaller percentages of people, we are different. We live differently now than we did 50 or 60 years ago when the identities of these parties were, were kind of minted. But that's why I feel like there is room for a third party to kind of rise up because yeah. I, I hear from people all the time emailing me, women in particular, saying, why isn't there a party that's like pro-choice and pro-gun? You know, yeah. because they, you can't really be pro-gun and be a Democrat. Republicans don't trust women with guns, I guess. You know? <laughs> or it's like, and abortion. I don't, and no, it's, and it, Democrats yeah. don't trust women with babies. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. And it's, it's so weird because if you look at it, like, you know, vast majorities of Americans, like, you know, 60, 70 percent want like abortion laws to basically stay the same. You know, or or get a little bit looser. Uh, people want guns. You know, like they want guns. Like it's weird, and people want free speech. It's weird. You can't express, you know, like these super majority opinions in any of the parties reliably. No, it's it's kind of bananas. I think though the other answer, and this was something that was easier to sell. To be honest, in the early two thousands, before nine eleven, and then you know, in Bush, Bush's second term, is that like one of the things that we need to have an awakening of, or a, a, you know, a come to Jesus moment where we say, you know what, we don't want politics to be the main arena in which we discuss how to live our lives. Mm. And so like, if you shrink the scope of politics and what you expect it to solve in people's lives, then it's, you know, it's a lot easier to form coalitions. Right. And one of the problems now, and, and this again, it goes through phases, the left now wants to politicize everything. Mm -hmm. And like, that's terrible because if you, you know, politics is a place where 50, you know, a, a slim majority gets to tell you what to do. And so you want, you want politics to govern as little of your life as possible, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't mean, you know, and, and politics can't solve a lot of problems. It's just because these problems are too difficult to solve or people have individual, you know, desires. Um, so if we stop making everything political, everything shouldn't be put up to a vote, you know, and this is also where I feel Republicans at various points when they're when they have more power, they start to flex that way. It's mm -hmm. really whoever thinks they're e either they're in power or they're about to become in power. They start, you know, want to politicize more and more shit. Um, and you always have to watch out for that because that ultimately, you know, the politicization of everything is just it's an awful world to live in. That's that's actually the take one of the takeaways from uh, you know the Soviet Union was that everything was politicized, right? And so it became a gray, conformist, terrible, non-innovative, impoverished society. And like to the extent that we are starting to say everything is political and or, and everything must be addressed through politics and elections and regulation. Man, that's like what a waste. No, I know. I agree. It's so. <laughs> yeah, it is because then it means like it just makes it harder to do stuff that's actually new and interesting. Yeah. And, and to see, I mean, it's all about experiments. It's like, you know, because, you know, people, you know, you try something and it doesn't work. And then not only do you learn from it, but, you know, other people do. Yeah. So it's like, you know, we need more Donner parties that are like, oh, you know what? Let's try that shortcut. <laughs> and it doesn't work. They learned a lesson and everybody around them learned a lesson. But if you say, like, no, you're not allowed to go there. You know, then we don't learn anything. Right. I, okay. So I'm glad this was optimistic. They're not yeah. usually this optimistic. Good. Usually I start really optimistic and then it's like, well, but then there's all these things. But I feel, I feel so 
ultimately lucky to be living in the time. Oh, yeah. It's like such a crazy wild time when even when we're doing dumpster fire because we're joking. We're always yeah. kind of joking about everything like the technology and whatever stupid low hanging fruit the left has tossed at us that I, week. And this and, is the thing that drives me the most nuts about millennials and Gen Z. And, and you know, I don't I don't know like what the actual generational survey say, but the the, the, the people who are speaking for them right. in, in the public realm, and it might not even, it might be people, old people like me, but when, you know, if they're, if they're talking about how this is a terrible way, a time to be alive, or that, you know, the planet is dead and dying, and not, <laughs> it's all darkness and ashes, you know, and it's like, man, you're so, you know, like, that's why, well, that's what history is here for, is to, like, understand where you are, yeah. what's working and what isn't. And also, like, I mean, for me, and I think this is the mark of a good society, is that people don't want to die because they know the future is going to be better. And right. Like, I don't want to miss that. You right. Know, I, I want to live longer because the world is better than it was when I was born, certainly better than when my parents were born or grandparents. And, and I want to be there you know, for you know, I want to see great grandchildren. I want to see the world in a hundred years or two hundred years. Because yeah. I think if we if we nail down a few basic ideas, it, it will just continue to get better. What are those basic ideas? Well, uh, you know, this is I think it's you know, limited government is is a big part of that. I think um, you know, um, respect for individual rights, um, mm. a, a tolerance for experimentation, for the type of innovation which is very disruptive. Uh, you know, so that like, I mean, if you're a travel agent, you know, you took it on the chin twenty years ago, right? right? You know, and it's like, but. You don't want to live in a world where they're like all the jobs that exist now must always exist right. because then you don't get anything new and it just you know through repetition things get worn down. I think you know having that mindset, you know a built-in appreciation or a tolerance for creative destruction, not just in the economic realm but in the social realm and in the cultural realm, being a seeker, being excited, um, you know, and and learning how to. Uh, you know, kind of imagine what is possible and then figuring out ways to build it. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the things that we need to do as opposed to, I think a lot of the discourse now is like, okay, everything that has been created is out there. And now it's, it's more about how do we, how do we dish it out to everybody mm -hmm. without understanding that the, whatever wealth in the world, whatever opportunities, whatever exists is, um, you know, it's not set or fixed. You mm -hmm. can't take it for granted. What you have to do is keep, you know, keep innovating, keep changing. Um, and, you know, you need <laughs> economics that allow for that. You need politics that allow for that. You need a psychology that allows yeah. for Yeah. One of the stories we covered this past week on Dumpster Fire was there was a um, big argument in Clubhouse about a whale who is actually owner owner of the original whale moan room where people are all moaning like whales and mm -hmm. then they got into this big woke argument about privilege and i was like there's yeah. nothing more privileged <laughs> than being on clubhouse in a whale mo ro moan oh, room i'm sure the porpoises are <laughs> like, like what about us yeah. you know why isn't anybody chippering like us clubhouse, that's just so funny to clubhouse, me so is a great example of something and i've been dabbling in it a bit and what a um, waste of time it is but it's also you know it's a kind of supplemental space now that appears just as <laughs> Twitter and Facebook. No, are I agree. Kind of crappy, right? People and, are like, come on, talk yeah. on my panel. I'm like, can you monetize it? No. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, can't, it's, it's I can't scale early this. Days. Yeah, it's early days. But you know what's funny is that like the next you that's based off of Clubhouse totally. is probably out there. And we She's just out don't there. know who they are. Yeah, yet. yeah, yeah, for sure. And yeah. we'll figure out how to monetize it in some way. But it reminds me of a virtual convention center. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I'm like, this is just like going right. to Comic-Con and you yeah. pop into a room and there's a panel about yeah. and there's four people on the yeah. stage and they're talking about Superman or whatever. Right, and right. then you walk out and you go into another room and yeah. they're having a discussion about, you know, making making Superman more woke or That's whatever. Right. Yeah. And, and it's endless. And it's in a endless. Way it's daunting. And I agree, like almost everything I do is kind of a waste of time. <laughs> Um, so adding Clubhouse, but but I think that the 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 takeaway from it is that it, it you know it it appeared nobody was predicting this nobody was planning for it it appears just as Twitter Spoon was already existing though yeah that's true 
Yeah. Spoon existed. Well, and it's like, you know, MySpace obviously existed before yeah, Facebook. Yeah, they just, they did a good job of branding it, making it exclusive, yeah. invite only. It right. has a nice design. Twitter is, is Twitter rolling out of version. Twitter fuels it, yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, and so it might be that, you know, uh, and I guess this goes back to some of the stuff we were talking about where, you know, with Substack or whatever, where uh clubhouse may not be the thing that lasts but it 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 creates the desire for and demonstrates an audience for something different right um you know and that that's in the same way that substack may not be the final state of journalism but it's it's broken open something yeah and that's all you need is like i was a big fan of the amazon series um uh, man in the high castle oh and yeah i loved what i loved about that i'm a huge philip k dick uh the novel who uh, the writer whose novel it's based on but the series is better but the idea of being able to jump to other timelines you know that in alternate realities and see what happened there and then kind of bring it back to what you you know what you're doing in your world mm. like knowing that knowing that there are options and alternatives i i almost choke up thinking about that because that's for me the study of literature and the study of history helped do that it's in the past but there's like an infinite number of possibilities yeah um and that what a lot of this technology allows us to do and it might just be for a moment it's that temporary autonomous zone where it's like oh is it a, a, a hallucination you know or yeah. something but it's like once you have that in your head then you can start to build you know, Minecraft, I, I, I predict, you know, that Minecraft probably gave rise to like, you know, dictators of the future that we don't understand yet, but also like some great thinkers who have come up with to radically different ways to live and to be probably worked it out on Minecraft. You right, know, as, as right. Like eight year olds or something. I mean, I see something even in my fantasy community, which is yeah. like a gated community. And it's a weird hybrid of, it's like if YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and Patreon all kind of met yep. and, you know, I work out with the girls in that community on Zoom now every right. day it's, and it's I've watched people help each other through death and I, yep. it, it became a virtual community of people where they could right. hash out. They felt safe having these conversations yep. that they don't feel safe having right. in the public anymore. And... And this, that's like something yeah. different and crazy. I'm like this. I, I take it for yeah. granted, but yeah. it's when the community, the pandemic came, and I cre it's that weird thing of where you create something and then it kind of saves right. you. Right. And so the pandemic hit, and then suddenly I I was cut off from everything, but I was watching them all interacting with each other and sharing bread recipes, yeah. and yeah. and it was so. I get choked up about that, just yeah. seeing everybody. Well, no, that's phenomenal. And a lot of the institutions or the frameworks that we inherited and just took for granted, they aren't delivering that anymore. Like churches are not right. delivering it. Uh, the university or the academy as a, an institution of trying new ideas and like producing knowledge. Like th it, that doesn't seem to be what it's about anymore. It's it's much more about kind of regimenting people's ideological viewpoints. Right. So what that means is like you know they're going to stick around and probably you know they've been around for a thousand years. They're going to be around for another thousand years. But a lot of people will evacuate that and then move into you know a a, a community like the one you're building or something else or you know a, an island, floating island somewhere, right? Things like that, and that that's. The type of thing that I think is really important to kind of look at and stress and create the conditions where it's easier to, you know, come up with these weird tree houses right. you know, that we want to live in right. for a while, recognizing that most of them are going to, you know, we're going to be done with them before we even finish, you know, hammering the last board. Right. Well, I asked the same two questions at the end of my podcast okay. when I remember. What is your biggest defect of character? Uh, that can know. be now or forever I, however you interpret it ah uh, boy you know um i i think i might cop out a little bit and say because that that's comes out of aa right well or in, therapy in yeah, it or can therapy. be i mean yeah. it's I, I you mean, can see they, it as they, vice you can think yeah. of it as well what i was going to say is that i the thing that i regret the most ah, in my one. life is you know is i i still take drugs um for recreation mostly psychedelics and and they don't cause the problems in my life that drinking did mm -hmm. and um i spent way too many years like i didn't realize until i started drinking we've had these conversations in other contexts but um i did not realize that i was like 
dr- you know, I had a problem mm. the way that I drank alcohol from the very beginning. It only emerged after, you know, like Mr. Magoo would have seen this first. Right. It's like obvious. <laughs> All of the clues, people telling me, you know, uh, relationships going south, you know, failures in other parts of my life. And I really, I think the biggest defect of character that I had, and I'm not sure if it is, but it's that I did not take seriously the well-meaning people around me who had told me that I had a problem. Mm. And it was just something that I couldn't, I, you know, I couldn't act on right. for, for too long. And, and it's not that now that I don't drink alcohol, it's not like I'm a perfect person or anything, but that's the biggest regret that I have because it was, un, you know, it was an auto goal, you know, it's like a cell phone. It was just, I wasted a lot of time and I hurt a lot of people yeah. by not, not being able to see what was so fucking evident. Yeah. You know, it's like- It's so. hard to see though. Yeah. I yeah, mean, especially when you're in it. And and of course, it's not just that. So like one of the things that I'm trying to do constantly is to figure out, okay, what, what are the analogous, you know, stupidities that I'm enacting every day without, right. you know, without confronting and kind of correcting. Mm. And what's your biggest asset? Oh, uh, I will. I will. Uh, I uh, one of the interviews I did back in my uh, teen mag days was with Michael Paré, who is the uh, he was best known for being an Eddie and the Cruisers, and mm. we always used to ask people like, you know, what's your best feature? Uh huh. And he said, my arms, <laughs> 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 which uh, he was a kind of classic dumb dumb. Uh, you know, it was great. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, if I'm talking about like my best asset, I think it's a work ethic. Um, and a willingness to kind of try, like to self improvement. It, mm-hmm. it at times it gets it's bad in the sense that like I really want to keep improving and I want to keep learning and I want to keep changing and growing. And then sometimes I mistake that, and I'm not particularly good at any of those things. But that's like you know kind of the energy, and it it makes me work. Um, but then at various points, I think it also makes me really impatient with people around me, whether they're, you know, people in my family or workers or close friends. And that that kind of makes me into a dick. Right. Know, because it's, uh, I, and not, this is a, a completely delusional jump as a metaphor, but I, uh, heard once that Larry Bird, you know, who's a great basketball player who was like a supreme, uh, a, a supreme, uh, competitor. He, he became a coach for a while of, uh, you know, like the Indiana Pacers and stuff. And he couldn't stand working with players who weren't constantly working mm. really hard to improve themselves. And as a result, he was like a shitty coach because mm. in the end, like, you know, the, the job of the coach isn't to make everybody the best they can be. It's to win games. And he was alienating people. And I think sometimes in my, what I see as like, okay, let's improve. Let's, let's never be satisfied or happy with where we're at. It's one thing if I strap, you know, myself with that on the back, if I lash myself with that, it's another thing if I'm kind of doing that to people around me, especially when a lot of the times I'm in error, you know, right. like, no, actually they're doing, they're doing incredible stuff and I'm just not seeing it because it's not what I want. Right. I love that. Well, where can we find you and all your work? Uh, you know, I'm at uh, Twitter always, sadly, uh, at, <laughs> at Nick Gillespie, all one word, all lowercase. Uh. But reason.com, I have all of the stuff that I do pretty much ends up there. I'm also on Instagram as Gillespie Nick. And uh, what's your podcast that you do? I do a weekly podcast called The Weekly, uh, The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. It's That's really the one good. That you did. And it's like an hour ish long deep dive into something typically talking talk with an author or a creative person or some kind of person who is doing some kind of interesting project. And we, and we just kind of go through that. Yep. Cool. Well, this has been a joy. I'm so glad I got to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and cousin Maggie. My check-in today is with my husband. Hello, Jaron. Hello, Bridget. (laughs) Thank you for having me back. So, are you okay during this difficult time? Well, I've recently sort of discovered some information about one of my favorite hobbies, and it's got me a little, a little troubled, a little, a little sad. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Some of their miniatures have decided to add pronouns to their bios, which I'm not opposed to pronouns in general, but 
tacking them on to Dungeons and Dragons miniatures is just a little bit too much. Are the miniatures for my people? liking? Yeah, they're usually fantasy creatures, sometimes elves and dwarves and humans and Yeah, it seems kind of stupid. And for a game that relies on imagination, I sort of fail to understand why you uh, might need that. I mean, I understand the desire to be inclusive, but it's been going this way for ages. I'm a, I'm a huge nerd. I grew up playing Dungeons and Dragons, like J.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, and Dungeons and Dragons were like the holy trinity of my childhood, right? You and do have the tattoos to prove it. I have the tattoos <laughs> to prove it, but they've progressively been going woke for Do you think this is now. just to draw a bigger audience? Do you think, here, let me ask you something, and maybe we can look this up, but do you think that it's, attracting more people or pushing more people away? I, I, You know what? I don't have the exact answer to that. My guess is it would be attracting new people. And, and let me just pause for a second to sort of put this into context. This is one sort of smaller company uh, uh, that decided to work with Dungeons and Dragons to make like a, a line of miniatures that uses pronouns. Most of the miniatures do not have that. Right. Um, at least as far as I know, I haven't bought any of these products sort of since they started going woke maybe a decade or so ago. But the role-playing game community is thriving. It's gotten bigger than ever and was doing that before the sort of pandemic happened. Um, so I imagine this is bringing in new new people. I'm sure there are old school gamers and people like me um, that you know it's a bit of a turnoff, but we're probably not buying those products anymore anyway. I right. haven't tried. If I play which i haven't in years i would use the stuff i have i have so much stuff <laughs> this is this so welcome to the dungeons and dragons podcast with <laughs> jared montgomery and bridget fetacy i, I want to learn not expecting it to go this way but i really want to learn how well, only because you've explained it to me as the best example of storytelling which i really uh, i need some practice in well i i I've always said I, f I feel it's the most pure form of storytelling, right? Where it's this collaborative effort happening in real time, almost like improv, except you're, you've got these characters you've created. And I feel like a super nerd right now, just so you know. But it's this stuff, you know, I loved this stuff growing up, and I still do. They just, there's these sort of stories you can create with your friends and the the bonds that you can make like sitting around a table or even online now is just you know i have just great memories um growing up playing these games it was my escape and so i wonder if the younger generations are just so used to the wokeness kind of everywhere that it doesn't even really phase them it's not it's normal yeah, this, to us, it's like a whole changing of the guard, and to them, they're like, "Well, what's the problem? Like, everyone has their pronouns; it's the thing." Yeah, this is very much a little bit like the get off my lawn, right? Like, I'm the old <laughs> grog nerd, like the old gamer that like grew up, you know, back in my day, and with all our sacred cows and things like that. But to to really get into this discussion, we would have to do a sort of history lesson <laughs> of the editions of Dungeons and Dragons and how it came to be in its current form. And that's, Ladies, that's are a you full getting pun. wet yet? <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Uh, so we could talk about firearms, maybe guns. <laughs> maybe I've been working out a lot lately. <laughs> I've been. It's no. I, I mean, I love the nerddom. Yeah, it's it's yeah something I've been a fan of for a while so anyway let's switch it up a little bit how have you been what's this week been like for you i've been in the doldrums as you know talk to me about that Bridget. <laughs> i'm not gonna hide okay i'm not gonna hide in public from my doldrum feelings um i feel like i've been in an algorithmic vortex you can just pull it out <laughs> That's what he's phrasing are we not doing phrasing anymore <laughs> People are gonna be like, <laughs> like what, what are is they doing? Going on there. We were gonna add video He's to this. Taking segment, the but... mic out of the mic stand, <laughs> folks. Get your minds out of the gutter. So uh, doldrums. Doldrums. Uh, an algorithmic vortex or black hole. Mm. And to give you an example of how sad you, the listeners, an example of just how sad it is to be married to me. <laughs> Yesterday. I was feeling sorry for myself and also invisible. 
So I went on my ride. I went on a bike. I have a, a Peloton. I'll just say it. I have a Peloton. I'm not ashamed. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Lean into it. And I was going to do a challenge. I was close to finishing a challenge. And I'm like, I can at least finish that and then say I accomplished something. And I finished it. And there was, this is the level of sadness I was at. I finished it. And they had updated the software and it didn't mark it as done. So I reached out to Peloton chat support and asked them about where my little robot badge of, you know, the gold star from the robot was that I needed to feel whole. Yeah, that's that's a lot. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure what I should say about that. I understand that feeling that desire to feel like you accomplished or completed something. But I and did in that do moment, it. you did accomplish something. But so it where matter. are my accolades? Yeah, it's where are my accolades robot. But it's even creepier because it's not from a human. It's like I, I want the accolades from this program. I need yeah. the badge from the program. Well, we've kind of as a society, we've gotten used to those rewards from our the dinging on our phone, our Apple Watch giving us the little circles that we completed, our how many steps we walked. We're today. being trained, so it's you know it makes perfect sense that you would want your Peloton to you know give you your give damn me my reward. like pat on the fucking back. So what so did you? Sad. So you reached out to Peloton support, <laughs> and, and they, they said, said <laughs> they said that. Um, they have heard of these issues. <laughs> mm, okay. And I was more of, I feel the sad chat support, you know, just mm. the sad kind of pathetic, like, as opposed to, as to probably like the aggressive. I bet there, you were saying this too, probably some hyper competitive people yeah. who were like, where's my fucking badge? Yeah. People like, had really I work bad for this. days. It's the end of the month, you know, you've got those monthly challenges coming up and people work for them and they need that and so i i was probably on the sad end of that spectrum as opposed to the aggressively competitive because i don't even look at the leaderboard it makes me feel ashamed have you gotten the badge yet it came today oh and how did it make you feel when you saw that badge i got the gold star from the robot so doldrum's done well, no, but oh, so back to my point. I was like, even the Peloton algorithm mm. isn't recognizing me. I mean, this is how self-absorbed and self-obsessed I am at times where it feels like none of the algorithms like me and even Peloton having some weird software bug completely reaffirmed my feeling that I was invisible to the matrix. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that's a dark spot to be in, Bridget. <laughs> It's fine. I mean, it sounds darker than it was. It's hard. You have these days where you push and push and push, and this is true for anyone. It's like anything you're trying to achieve. Yeah. It's a lot like a hit class. You've got those peaks, and then you've got those valleys where you're just kind of chilling, and you're and you're recovering, and you're just rolling through and going through the motions, and there isn't tons of growth. Yeah. And it's okay. So. What in those instances or how do you get yourself through those? Maggie. Do you have Maggie? Yeah. yeah. I have to call Ma poor, 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 poor Maggie and have her give me a motivational speech, basically. Or I have to get on Peloton and have one of those psychos give me a motivational speech. Yeah. Because they're all psychos. Maggie's really In the best good kind of way, but at, Maggie's at good. The motivational speech. Well, and she has the institutional awareness of Phetasy Inc. And I will say that sounding like we're a real company, but she's been around since day one. And so she has the ability to be like, remember yeah. how many years you had $7 in your bank account? Decades. Yeah. Remember when you went bankrupt. Remember when you were just trying to get this off the ground and wanted to sell t-shirts and now you're doing those things. Yeah, and she's she's got that level of insight that that is vital that I I just don't have from those years. I didn't I didn't grow up watching you build this amazing company that you have now and the sweat and tears and blood and money that you put into it and so you know, as as much as I'd like to fill all those roles, I I can't. No. And that's not healthy anyway. No, no, I wouldn't. It's it's. I don't. Yeah, I don't think a spouse should have to fill all those roles. You sh you probably do enough motivational speaking as it is, and you're in your work, your own work sure. with your clients, yeah. and then 
just day to day having to deal with me waking up singing jingles about how fat I am. <laughs> All women have body image issues, I swear. It's And the ones that don't, I God bless you, it's so hard. But I try to make fun of it by making fun of myself and I'll be like, I'm a fat so boom bullet so Yeah, the self deprecating <laughs> humor is profound. That's um, what motivates me. Is is shaming yourself in <laughs> humorous ways. I'm Catholic. That's exactly uh, how Catholics interact with each other. We shame each other with humor. God, and, and since neither of us drink, there's no real way to just drown that. No, I would do- totally be drowning. So here's progress. Back in my drinking and smoking weed days, I would have dealt with yesterday by probably getting blackout drunk yeah. and making questionable decisions or just smoking a bunch of weed and, you know, yeah, checking dr- out drinking, completely. Drinking that half a bottle of cooking sherry we have in the top shelf of our kitchen. I haven't even thought about that, but looks like someone else has. <laughs> hey, uh, Is it speaking? T- let me know when it starts talking to you. <laughs> no, that would be, you would you, you would know if I got into the cooking that sherry. That would be the be saddest pretty. It wouldn't be going pretty, I'd out. Be, I'd have my D and D books out, and I'd be playing with like miniatures and crying <laughs> and talking about my childhood, and it would be. And be and I would be like, "You went out on cooking, Sherry. That's like that's like people who are like. One time, I wanted to smoke weed, and my friend shamed me out of it. They were like, "That's the lamest relapse ever." <laughs> Yeah. You're gonna relapse, relapse like a woman. I mean, there are definitely grades of relapsing on a on a scale there, and cooking sherry is pretty low. That's like you that hear one. about the people who drink mouthwash or Nyquil, right? Yeah. Oh, good grief. <laughs> <laughs> That's dark. A lot of judgment, right? That here. was like that was like when I wanted to relapse at Islands. I had this <laughs> fantasy <laughs> at Islands. Tell tell me more. Just. There's something really tragic about those chain, the bars in those chain restaurants. I don't know why I feel this way about them because I like local pubs and bars and things that are more just either dive bars or yeah, usually dive bars. So the the whole idea of like a chain, going to a chain to get drunk, it reminds me of the Midwest because wow. often you have to just drive to like an Applebee's to get drunk. And also just, I don't know, there's some weird sadness of like going out on a pina colada in an island. <laughs> you must have been <laughs> devastated when the islands <laughs> when near it us closed because that, that <laughs> makes that fantasy a little less accessible. You may have to- I used to think about it all the time. I was I would be like, that's it, I'm going down to islands and my friends would be like, Well, that's fucking dark, Bridget. <laughs> a pina colada and some cheddar fries. I feel like you need the suicide hotline. Yeah, that's I don't, that's an odd relapse sort of fantasy. Relapse fantasies are weird. It's like relapse ideation. You know, yeah. there's there's a weird version of that where I always have the same one, and luckily, if I play the tape long enough, it gets to being in a bar doing lines off a toilet. But when oh I God. think about going down to on the waterfront and getting one of those big ass beer, the like the the ones with the orange in them sure and the, the hefeweizen or whatever they were and the sun setting and it's glimmering off the beer and the orange and then i just smoking just a little bit of that sweet cali weed and the like that feeling of being so like warm and the fuzzy distance of yeah. reality Ignoring all the homelessness and high taxes. <laughs> <laughs> just, just totally in blissful ignorance. And and then I'd end up at the townhouse doing lines. Yeah, inevitably. See, that's the problem. I, they all sound, none of it sounds good to me. But that was the problem is that they all ended up with me, you know, smoking something I shouldn't be smoking <laughs> in a place i shouldn't be (laughs) right so like i i don't have fantasies of course i have every once in a while there's that i want to be the scotch drinker you know and yeah a cigar and you know that air of sophistication but that's just an illusion for me that's not possible yeah Um, and i know that and i'm i'm totally okay with that i'm not okay with it for me with with the alcohol or the it's more the weed though is it both of them but it's a lie i tell myself Hmm. 
It's like, oh, I I just wish I could have one nice glass of wine with dinner. And it's like, I never had one glass of wine. I never wanted one glass of wine. I never had one glass of wine. I have horrific stories of me going to wine tastings, making a complete fool out of myself at these fancy things. I mean, people just sipping and drinking normally at this pairing with this amazing gourmet food and I'm drunk at the bar. I'm. It's just embarrassing to think about. This is going to turn into a war stories check. No, but that <laughs> I, I have to remember those things when I have those kind of uh, ideations. So let me ask which, you. Which like on a day like yesterday, I obviously have them. So how does today compare to yesterday then? How are you today? I'm good today. I think I just, the best thing about sobriety and the hardest thing is truly what my very first sponsor said. And all that all of sobriety is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I was uncomfortable yesterday. It triggers all my feelings of worthlessness, insecurity, not being enough, not doing enough, not enough. That's the feeling like when the algorithm isn't rewarding me or I feel like, where are my accolades or comparing and despairing to other people who are doing better than me, quote unquote, or growing faster. I end up in that place of feeling like I'm doing something wrong. There's also this feeling of, well, I'm just wrong. There's also this weird feeling of I'm delusional. You know, I I don't know what I'm thinking that I can build like some kind of little cul-de-sac or I end up feeling at the very end of that worthless. And I have to just be <laughs> uncomfortable, yeah. you know, and sit with that. There's some days where it's like, okay, you feel uncomfortable. Working out helps. H- walking with hope and playing with hope helps. Just being with you and reading helps. Being in present in our cooking dinner helped. Just being present in life and knowing that, you know, today I get to have another day. And I had a great podcast this morning and went to a doctor's appointment and it's all very, it's all very strange sometimes, sobriety. Yeah. I'm used to the super highs and the super lows and I'm still, ha- I still have a hard time with just the routine. Yeah, it really is to use the cliche like one day at a time and sometimes it's even less, sometimes it's an hour or a minute, but it really is being present and, and knowing that that feeling you're feeling in the moment will pass. So yeah, hopefully you'll get over your Dungeons and Dragons um, trauma. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've got some work to do around it, but uh, I think I'm I'm ready. I see I see big things in your future. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I see some journaling in your future. <laughs> some journaling, right? <laughs> We might have to we might have to have a game of Dungeons and Dragons with you, Sam and Maggie. I yes, we should we live can, stream we can it. Live stream it. That, that would be, be amazing. That would be a good laugh. I'd like to thank my sponsors this week: Beta Brand, The Jordan Harbinger Show, and Calm. Find out why women are ditching typical work pants for Beta Brand's dress pant yoga pants. Go to betabrand.com/walkin for thirty percent off. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show, that's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. For listeners of the show, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash walkin. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Phetasy. I'm Bridget Phetasy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs)